everyone, and welcome back to another episode of the TetraCast. This is RPG Site's weekly podcast where we get the site staff together to talk about our favorite genre of video games. I'm the host. My name is Brian Vitali. Joining me, we have Josh Torres. A weird week. Adam Vitali. Hello. And Chao Min Wu. How's it going? It is nearing the end of March. It has been an insanely busy week. Absolutely none of us stayed up until 7 a.m. playing video games. Definitely not. By the way, how's James doing? (laughs) Oh, yeah. Uh, He probably also stayed up, I assume, until 7 a.m. playing video games. And that's my best guess, because he has not checked in. So we might hear from him. We might not. We'll see. Uh, We were hoping he would be here. It's been a pretty big release for video games and for RPGs in general. We had, and we've kind of teed this up throughout most of the start of the year. We had two big games for us release on the same day on March 22nd. And of course, that is Legend of Legacy, HD Remaster, and Princess Peach Showtime. Hell yeah. just, right. It was Dragon's Dogma 2 and Rise of the Ronin. All four of those games released on March 22nd. So we're, we're recording this on the 23rd. So. By the time you listen to this, these games will be out, will have been out for a few days. And of course, we did have a few people on site able to cover these games for us, write reviews. And we have most of them, Sans, James, present to talk about both Dragon's Dogma 2 and Rise of the Ronin. So we're going to start out with Dragon's Dogma 2. I know that James was able to write a review for us and put that up on the site. We were hoping he would be here. Maybe he'll still show up. But also, Adam and J- uh, Josh have been able to put time into Dragon's Dogma 2. And this might be a game that might cover a couple podcasts. We'll kind of see how March and April go. It's pretty packed schedule, so maybe not. And then we'll wrap up into Josh's impressions of Rise of the Ronin, which released on the same day. And then we have a decent amount of announcements and news from this week. Uh, we thought April was packed before. It's surprisingly got even more packed over the last couple of days. So we'll go into that. We'll go into some more release dates and some sales updates, uh, the usual fare. So without further ado, of course, Dragon's Dogma 2, a game that I'm very interested in. It is already downloaded on my computer, but I've not had a chance to play it. I'm still working my way through Unicorn Overlord. But I do know that Adam has put a fair bit of time into this game alongside James and others on the site. In the absence of James, we'll go ahead and hand the microphone off over to Adam. And then I do know, of course, that Josh has also put some time into it as well. So Dragon's Dogma 2 introduced this game. I know, I believe all of us here, I'm not sure about Chow, have played the original. But Dragon's Dogma 2 has sold, and at least in terms of like, there's a lot to talk about in terms of reception and sales and performance and things like that. It seems to be another Capcom hit. Not everyone has played Dragon's Dogma 1. So tee up for us. What sort of game is this? It, it looks kind of like a Western RPG, but of course it's developed by Capcom. Uh, what is Dragon's Dogma 2? And just give us your thoughts on it, Adam. So the most, or I should say the least generous description I can give of Dragon's Dogma 2 is that it's just Dragon's Dogma again. The most generous description yeah. that I could tell you say about Dragon's Dogma 2 is that it is Dragon's Dogma again, <laughs> in that they kind of stuck to their guns in terms of of when they decided, you know, years ago to make a sequel to Dragon's Dogma or a follow-up, um, how are they going to approach it? Uh, what do they take from Dragon's Dogma? What do they take from other inspirations? And how do they put it together? And for the most part, Dragon's Dogma 2, and you can, you can, you'll see this as you play the game, as if, if you've played the original, as well as if you've seen interviews with Itsuno, the director, it's pretty much just they how do i put this so a couple months ago i actually played dragon's dogma one and we talked about it on the podcast and generally speaking i kind of described it as like a game with a very evidently like high ceiling in terms of like its concepts and its structure and what it does and how it's different from other from you know games uh open world sorts of action rpg type games of its type um, but it didn't quite reach it. And I even said it in, at ways almost felt like incomplete, not necessarily a bad way, just sort of like didn't quite reach that ceiling. There were like a lot of cool ideas, but maybe wasn't fleshed out as well. And we even know after the fact that there were a lot of ideas that didn't make it to the game. So Dragon's Dogma 2 basically is Itsuno and Capcom's, you know, 
time to take all those concepts and ideas that weren't able to make it into the original game and do them this time. So that's what I mean by like being Dragon's Dogma again, because it is very similar to Dragon's Dogma 1. In fact, this is not a spoiler because it's pretty much the opening of the game. Uh, when you, the title drop and the title screen in Dragon's Dogma 2, it doesn't say 2, it just says Dragon's Dogma, which I feel is intentional. It's basically, this is Dragon's Dogma, the concept that they had re-envisioned, fully realized. I feel like that's a phrase that you'll hear a lot when discussing this game is fully realized this time around. So um, if you have played Dragon's Dogma, and I'm very glad I did, one second, give me one second, uh, this game will feel very familiar, but you'll also kind of be already, you already have a leg up on, on people coming in new because you'll kind of understand some of those weird quirks to Dragon's Dogma both like conceptually in terms of like how it works, what do pawns do, how do you use them, as well as even more more functional things like how does saving work? Because it's all the same. And what were you saying? I was just going to say, when we talked about Dragon's Dogma a few, a month ago on the podcast, we were very careful with our language where it doesn't feel like an incomplete game. It feels just like a deliberately narrowed scope game like they were, they realized that in order for them to deliver they couldn't incorporate everything that they had on the table they had to focus on certain areas so it feels like a complete game we, i know i just i just kind of want i just remember that discussion between uh me you and and josh saying the dragon's dogma one didn't feel incomplete it just felt like oh, okay this is something that they had an idea for um but they didn't implement it here where i have not played dragon's dogma two it's just it's interesting to hear everyone use terms like fully realized because that just makes me really eager to play it to see like because I Dragon's Dogma one I I played in 2018 or whenever the PC version came out so it's right on it's right at the point where I start forgetting exactly how it worked when because if you ask me before all discussion in Dragon's Dogma two like how does saving work I'd be like I don't quite remember it's just it's just normal right and then you start saying no there's a camp and there's an inn I'm like oh yeah I, I do rem remember that so I'm eager to get into Dragon's Dogma two to kind of revisit um just that just the gameplay stylings of that game of the series so, so so starting out basically you get a very quick kind of tutorial area in the game where you are in a you're basically captured and you're like a slave almost at some mining camp uh i believe it's a long time ago i probably have like 70 hours in the game and then after a quick tutorial that kind of just explains like how to move and how to pick up stuff and whatnot you're basically set off into the world and you learn about pawns right away. Um, I'm not going to describe everything about like how do pawns work here. It's one of those things you kind of know you don't if you play the game. Um, but really, the game is pretty quick in terms of uh, unleashing the world on you in terms of just like, all right, you have your pawn, you can cre you created your character, you created your pawn, and you, are, you have a couple of you know tasks that you need to do. You, if your first task you need to do is basically need to go to the city and then it's like all right now do what you want so it is an open world game in a sense but it's pretty different from a lot of like modern open world games and it's actually a little bit tricky for me to articulate why exactly i will say one thing though the map the open world map in this game there are no ubisoft towers it's actually pretty old school in that the map fills out as you explore it <laughs> You know, just the different roads you go on and whatnot. Um, so you're not just like beelining for some sort of tower or whatever to like fill out zones of the map. It's really just like, where have you been and where have you not been? And that's what you can see on the map. But also just like the functional design of the map itself. There's a lot of like main roads that you go to um, that are in between like the main city hubs of the, of the world. And then there's like a lot of off like beaten paths where... Uh, with a lot of, you know, creatures and dungeons and little settlements and quake caves that you can go to, ruins. And it's it's a pretty dense world. And after you play for the game for a while, you actually realize that it's not gigantic. It's pretty big. And it's bigger than the original Dragon's Dogma. But really, and just in terms of, like, sheer size, it's pretty dense. And you'll actually be spending quite a lot of time kind of retracing your steps because the game will actually kind of have quests and things that require you to go to certain places or figuring out talking to certain people or figuring out certain things. And it's not just, you know, going to new, you know, 
this huge map, you know, just combing it, going over this huge map all the time. It's 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 kind of the way you approach it is pretty different from a lot of games. Um, I'm just I, mean, I guess I'm curious, Brian, going into Dragon's Dogma, which I know you're very interested in, interested in, but you haven't played yet. Is there any like one particular thing that you're kind of wondering about that you hadn't seen, like or well, hadn't the, based heard about? on the way you're describing it, I think the way the thing I'm about to say. Josh would have to be the arbiter of because he's the only one that has his legs in both of these. But when the way you're describing that map, it's a, it reminds me of Elden Ring. But I I've played Elden Ring and not Dragon's Dogma. You played Dragon's Dogma but not Elden Ring. Okay, I, so I actually said Josh this. This say. here's here's my description. Here's my point of comparison. It's not a great one. I mean, there's a lot of open world games now, so I'm sure you can make many depending on what you played. But I was just mm -hmm. thinking, uh, Dragon's Dogma's two Dragon Dogma. 2's map is so much better than something you get out of like Forspoken or Assassin's Creed Valhalla, both games I played, open world games. And those, both of those games, especially like Forspoken, how do I put this? Those feel more the classic open world. And Forspoken's open world, it's just like a bunch of nothing, like no dynamic nothing in the world map except it's dotted with like here's a trial or here's a cat that you can get or you know kind of those checklisty sorts of things and assassin's creed has a ton of that too whereas um dragon dogmas 2's world map doesn't feel like a checklist it's not like oh i have to find the 27 doohickeys here and there and they fill out the map and you know they're dotted on the map somewhere and you have to find them all the only thing that's really close to that is there are there are secret tokens, but they're they're kind of a minor thing. Really, you're exploring the map to find like places or enemies or people. I guess you could count like caves as a countable thing, but it, it doesn't feel like a sort of collectathon map. That's how I'll put it. Yeah, um, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll kind of chime in on like I, I first I'll welcome James Galizio to the podcast. Uh, welcome, I know uh, you probably had a late night as well. Yeah, I, I was trying to get to sleep, and then I saw Adam having trouble with uh, something. I, and I figured it out, song. though. <laughs> yeah. uh, so it's Adam's fault. So, so second... No, no, Brian, fault. no I didn't... Uh, uh, so, Brian, <laughs> I, I'm trying to understand your question. So you're try trying to see, like, where does Dragon's Vault Dogma 2 fall in line with something like Elden Ring in terms of, like, open-world design, right? The way that Adam described it made me think of Elden Ring but I don't know if that's a good comparison. That's just so, what I was thinking of the way Adam was describing how Dragon's Dogma map kind of is incorporated into the gameplay. I, I'm so here. Here's a weird thing. So I'm 15 hours, roughly 15 hours into this game. I would say, but I think I think about the open world approach to Dragon's Dogma 2 compared to Elden Ring. I think Dragon's Dogma 2's open world is a lot more. Dense, it's smaller than Elden Ring, but it's a lot more dense in the same in the way that you can go into a direction and you're it's not necessarily something that like you see something in particular in the distance that catches your eye. I think Dragon's Dogma 2, um, like much like the first, but I think this establishes it in a much better fashion because the way uh, the the bump the visuals and animation quality compared to before, and the way that this game has a lot more like forests for example when you think about the first dragon's dogma it's a lot of open fields while in this one there's a lot more its environments are a lot more dense with like uh greenery where it's like it's, you're surrounded by trees constantly in like the first part of this game and when it comes to like traveling to somewhere in elden ring you would have to you rarely traveled by foot on elden ring you always relied on your horse because the next thing that you wanted to get to was usually off in the distance while in dragon's dogma 2's case Things are a lot more scaled down, where it's a lot, where it's a lot more manageable to get there on foot. It doesn't take like twenty to twenty-five minutes to get like from the city to like the the, the uh, an eastern village that you have to get to. It, it, uh, so you don't have to like. It doesn't feel like that's like oh, it's some like crazy journey that'll take like forty minutes to get to. So I wish I had like you know a horse with me. There's a lot less like like open dead. Um, space in between uh th that's how i think of it if, if you find enjoyment in the mundaneness of traveling on foot because of the way that like it feels like you're an adventure with your pawns in the way that some of them can lead you some of them like on the way might say hey i found a cave 
do you want to go, go explore it? And then you, you then you kind of sidetracked in that way. Like, oh, they found a cave that they've seen before. I want to go see where it's at. Or they found a treasure chest. So on the way there, much like, you know, Elden Ring and Breath of the Wild, where, like, you can get sidetracked, but your destination in itself isn't, it, isn't as, like, as far as you think it is, especially when you're traveling on foot. Traveling is also pretty dynamic in that, like, going in between the main city and that eastern village, if you make that trip a couple of times, you'll probably run into a couple of different things because it's not always going to be, like, the exact same path or... yeah. Even, like, the enemies you'll meet, they're not always the same. There are certainly spots that, like, there is sometimes an ogre in this area or whatever, but not always. And the world is also just kind of cool. This is just kind of a small thing, and on its face kind of seems, like, not that important. But I actually kind of love how in Dragon's Dogma 2, you can just be... So once I left the city in Dragon's Dogma 2, and then there, there was a griffin, like, right outside the city, right there in, like, the fields... And a bunch of the knights and even farmers were like trying to tackle it, fight it, and whatnot. Oh and yeah, I, I saw that griffin on the, in the fields, like you know, early part yeah, two. But it, like, it doesn't like, oh, happen oh, always. Shit. Yeah, but, it doesn't happen always. Uh, and then like sometimes you'll just actually pretty frequently you'll find just like adventures, just NPC adventures out in the world fighting, you know, ogres or cyclops or uh, goblins or whatever, and mm-hmm. they can help you out. You can help them out. Uh, it kind of makes the world feel kind of dynamic. Like once yeah. I ran into like a couple of knights fighting a chimera, and I was like, "All right, I'll help out and get some exp and get some drops here." And then it's it kind of becomes a spectacle in that sense, almost where you have your t- party of pawns, and then just some like random dudes help it out. Like I know that doesn't sound like that important or maybe even that cool. I just think it it makes the world feel more alive. The most bizarre thing that happened to me in this game that has only happened to me, and I haven't uh, no one like everyone's like, "What the fuck?" at, at this is. So at, at at in Vernworth, this this uh, city of Vermont, like the capital. Yeah. Um, I I rested at the inn, at, uh, uh, and then you know rest till morning, and then I wanted to meet Sven, which is one of the quest NPCs, side quest yep. NPCs that you find at this um, opening part of the the city. So uh, as I was like running up to Sven, I noticed that one of my pawns enchanted my weapon. Like like we were in battle. I'm like that's weird. So I was talking to Sven, and I hear like bat like uh, some, something behind me like it's like people were like fighting behind me so i as i'm talking to sven I, I i rotate the camera i see three lizard men fighting oh, yeah. my pawns on the on the stair steps in behind me as i'm talking to sven i'm like what the fuck is going on <laughs> and it's just happening as i'm talking to sven yeah like you, we're just having the city will out. sometimes get attacked by random enemies um and it's yeah. like behind me and i'm like it what can the- make it can be like uh boss type enemies too like i remember like uh, there's been at least a couple times where i've uh, rested at my uh, house because you can get ha- like a you house get a house pretty early that's not yeah. really a spoiler yeah. um and uh, i would walk out into the main like uh, kind of square and all of a sudden it'd be like hey drake what are you doing here i've never seen a drake <laughs> that seems extreme i have seen goblins and wolves though and so it was just like it was very funny because it was like it's just something I was what it wasn't expected. It was just like and then and then of course like of course the the AI routine was didn't account for like hey we're just still have it's like Zven didn't like panic and like this is happening. We're just like still kind of chatting about like you know <laughs> some other stuff. So it was, it was like okay. a very funny occurrence that like uh, like that uh, among my circle of friends like I seem to be the only one who has happened so far to it. It's like it's just one of those things that like it, like it feels like things. Can become unpredictable, unpredictable in the most like trivial, trivial ways. Like you'll you'll never expect it. You just think it's gonna be just a normal day in the world of Dragon's Dogma Two, and then you know familiar familiar scenery that you've walked you know dozens of times will be different because there's something that's happening there, and that and that's totally not scripted at all. It's just like it's just something that's like I don't know. It just fucking happened, and you're just like, all right, I'll deal with it. And th- and that's kind of the and that's kind of the the sentiment that. Dragon's Dogma One tries to like it, not not as robust, obviously, as Dragon's Dogma Two, but it is finding joy in what would otherwise be mundane tasks in other games, and I, I think that's and that's what kind of elevates it because you feel like you you live in this world in a somewhat convincing fashion. I, I love it. you can go on an ox cart to travel to the next town and just just take a nap, and then if everything goes well, you'll end up in the next town. And you know you got a good nap on the way. It's almost like fast travel. 
Uh, or if things but, go wrong, you'll get attacked by a cyclops and uh, they'll destroy your cart and then you'll be stuck out in the wilderness and have to put, put it the rest of the way. But yeah, I, yeah so it's like when you say take a nap, does it actually like fade to black or do you? Yes, it fades to black. And then you get attacked okay. while you're napping. Uh, so it's kind of, you know, it's just kind of fun. It costs money, not that much money to actually, it's pretty cheap to, to do the ox cart. There's a reason but, why it's pretty cheap. Yeah, there, it's just a cart with an ox. Um, but uh, there's like a small envoy of like uh, mercenaries following it to protect it. But uh, if you get like um, raided by an ogre or something, they're going to need help. So and there's been a couple of times I've been raided by a cyclops and cyclops are not really that dangerous. Once you get a bit into the game, they're they're honestly kind of pushovers, but they always manage to de- seem to destroy the cart still. It's like, come on. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've had uh, that happen. I think the funniest thing I've had happen when a uh, Cyclops raided uh, the cart is I actually managed to defeat it, but when I killed it, it falls on the cart. When it, like, ra- yeah, it falls yes. into the cart, and then the cart started galloping away because they were, like, freaking out. <laughs> and I did I'd... that for, like, five seconds, and then finally the weight of Cyclops was just like, okay, so, uh, yeah, the cart just broke now. And that and that's and this is like uh, where Dragon's Dogma Two also kind of carries on the spirit of Dragon's Dogma, Dragon's Dogma One, where it is a game about you find your own stories for yourself because of how the way that the immersive gameplay surfaces that game. You'll be there. You'll you'll go into gameplay session about you know, two to three hours, and you'll have like five to six mini stories to tell about like crazy things that happened uh, I'll, I'll, during that gameplay session. So now that James has joined us, you reviewed this game, gave it a perfect 10 on the site. Kind of give us like, you know, your brief, like, you know, overall impressions of the game and like what you thought of the game, having done like a full playthrough of it. Yeah. So like uh, Adam's already given like a good, a great like number of examples for why I feel like uh, the game deserved the uh, praise I gave it. Uh, but I guess to kind of focus on some other things, like, yeah, the world is very dense. It feels like very organic and how things react and how you might just find stuff randomly. And it makes it feel like, I I think one of the things that stood out to me when playing it is it feels less like a video game open world and more like an actual like place. Yeah. I call that 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 like a checklist in other games. It doesn't feel like a checklist. Yeah, and that might seem a bit cliche, but I think it's kind of important when you're playing like an RPG like this that it feels like you can actually kind of immerse yourself. Not every game needs that, but for something like Dragon's Dogma 2, that's very clearly one of the core things that the team wanted players to feel while playing the game. Um, And the other thing that really stood out to me when I was playing it is, man, this game's side quests are like consistently really really good (laughs) yeah i was gonna bring up we should talk about we should talk about like character class combat stuff a bit but also just the side quests there we talked about we actually sort of touched on this kind of idea with thaumaturge a couple weeks ago and that there's a certain level of ambiguity to side quests and that they're not so signposted in dragon's dogma 2 as well as thaumaturge um where you'll get like a task um, like just kind of a random, a real one. Like I need someone to translate this kind of code message and it doesn't tell you who or where, but if you're paying attention, you might know, you might have an idea or you might have, you know, some thoughts about like, who should I talk to or where should I go? Or like you'll have quests where you'll meet a person and they'll tell you that, you know, it'll just kind of mark in your, in your log, like you met a person and see what happens next. It, 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 it's not just go here, do this, go here, do this. It kind of trust the player to sort of have already have spoken and explored the world a bit and be like, do you remember who might know something about this or where you might go or, you know, have some idea or maybe you read, uh, there's not that many, like, there's not, not there's not that many, like item, like novel or uh, how do I put this, like notes that you can pick up, in but game. there are a few. In game books. Yeah, there's a few, definitely not as much as Thaumaturge, but there are a few like notes and things that might kind of clue you in on, on things here and there. Like there's a couple around the slums area, for instance, that I will mention. But um, it's it kind of trusts the player to be like, here's something you want to try to figure out. Can you figure it out? Um, now, of course, even now already, but definitely months from now, you can probably go to the go to Dragon's Dogma 2 wiki and have it eventually, it's all gonna be 
you know, straightened out in terms of like, you can talk to this person or you can talk to this person. It's going to be all figured out mathematically or whatever, but going at it just as it is, especially like in the review period where we're all kind of, none, none of this has been guided or anything. You kind of just have to trust, you know, your exploration and talking to NPCs and figuring out what to do. And it's not just, it's not just like the puzzle solving element of it, but it's also like the narrative side of things in terms of, oh, these, these people are, you know, they are, they have, how do I put this? It has to do with like the, the Batal Kingdom that I haven't really been to yet, but you kind of learn through the side quests about like some of the tensions between the couple of kingdoms, some of the different players, some of the key characters that are in the, in the world. And so you're learning about that as part of like literally the narrative, but also if what you know about that will affect how you approach the quest. So I know I'm being a little bit vague, but that's what the quest design is like. But but yeah. even even on a smaller scope, like Adam and I were talking about this before the podcast, of like uh, two two examples that don't like are very spoiler free. Like one one quest early on, you you visit you visit a magist magistrate that's uh, in a cell, and mm -hmm. the way that like we went about like the finale of that quest are very two different things. Where you know to to get this magistrate out, like the maybe the quote unquote intended way uh, was to put on a disguise and then uh, escort them throughout another way. And then for me, we'll get into this later, but my, my starting vocation was a thief. I'm almost done with thief and might, you know, switch to another one. But uh, throughout this whole chain of quests that, like, had, uh, like, a small stealth side to it, like, I just put on, like, this, uh, some, like, this shadow cloak skill on the thief. And all I did for that was, like, well, I don't really know the other way out of this. So I just had to carry this magistrate over my shoulder while I'm cloaked and then just go back up the way I came on the spiral staircase and that kind of does completion too. It's like, all right, thanks. And I'm, like, I'm okay, actually cool. curious about like what happens after that. Cause that character does, you know, you can meet with him later and I'm curious how that works. <laughs> so, yeah. And, and then the second example was uh, there's these two quests, uh, uh like uh, on a, not on the same quest line, but like in a similar, uh, chain where there's a specific character named Wilhelmina that you meet but there are two specific quests uh, that you could potentially meet her for the first time, uh, apparently. So the first way is through this masquerade ball that uh, I believe you, uh, you Adam, you met her there for the uh, first time. Yeah, I did time. that first. Okay. Same. Yeah. Okay. So I, I did that. I'm apparently doing the opposite waiver. I snuck into an office. Yeah, yeah, I did the minister, minister quest, and I, I met her there for the first time. Uh, so now I have this masquerade that I have to attend to uh, next, and then obviously my interactions with her will be different there because I've already been acquainted with her on that way. So I'm interested to see, I guess, report back to to Adam and James on like how that uh, unfolds because I, I you know, I, I, by pure chance, just decided to like do things in a different order, so you have different interactions yeah. and maybe different results. And those are actually main way. quests, but you can do them in. A, quite a few different orders so yeah um it probably permutes a little differently depending on how exactly you, you went about it um yeah. but there's like i think early on probably the best example i can give i won't be specific but there are a couple of quests that involve that it's like part chapel part orphanage part hospital in the slums and there's a handful of quests there that kind of intersect and overlap with a few other things and i'm actually still wondering there's a couple of quests that I have finished and it's done in my log. I got a prize, I got a reward, but I'm also kind of like, I feel like there was another way to do this, but I don't know what it was. Like, yeah. And I think, <laughs> I think Adam and I are thinking of the same quests and it's like, okay, is there a different, like potentially, well, maybe not better outcome, but more interesting outcome. If you intentionally fuck this portion of it up, because you, the game seems to let you, if you want to, well, and yeah, there there's was, like that signposting quest? there. So there's the Saint of the Slums quest, which I won't mention any more than that, as well as, uh, yeah, that the quest you're talking about, which, which, which the title of it, I forget, which involves a noble family. And there's a handful of, yeah, it's just, I, I'm just curious, like, you know, maybe I didn't talk to the, a, a particular person that I wasn't aware was connected to this quest somehow or, or what have you. So, yeah, it's just, and I'm kind of curious. Yeah, and to be clear, it's not just us being, like, conspiracy theorists, because... This game has so many quests that have like really fascinating outcomes and really messed up outcomes if you don't do it the right way. <laughs> we were just talking uh, earlier about the Hugo quest. 
which I'll leave it at that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, God. And I, it, it's so funny because uh, that quest, which I won't say anything specific about, is also a great example of even if something's not on your quest log, the game will react to what you're telling NPCs. Yep. So like... Adam had a quest for this person. I didn't have the quest yet because I didn't get the trigger from another NPC. But I oh. gave this person this information and might have gave them a means to uh, act on it. Yeah. And then uh, a couple of in-game days later, I was uh, because I didn't immediately try and like intercept. I like another NPC was like, hey, so uh, we found that person. He's dead. <laughs> Yeah. It's, it's it's also interesting too because like I'll, I'll like it seems to be a good chunk quests are very much tied to like in game time and of the world in the sense of like oh meet with this person a week later uh, and then yeah. you know you can you can advance this quest then so like obviously you can do kind of the the lame way about it like hey just sleep for five days or so and then proceed it or you can just like you know just play the game normally and then get back to circle around back to that quest uh, to you know advance it. Yeah, I will. But... I'll say. I'll say. I will say one thing. Early on in this game, there is like a tutorial quest. It's really simple. It's basically like, go save our friend who's out there fighting some goblins, and then the game will be like, this is a timed quest. You better do this, or else they're gonna die. And I was actually kind of like, almost like intimidated by that. Like, oh god, this is gonna be really tough to like manage all this. But I'm like 60, 70 hours in the game, and there's not that many like timed quests like that. So it, it's it's very, very manageable. It's not like you're going to have to... I was sort of paranoid that I'm going to have to like spreadsheet out like my schedule. Like, oh, I better do this quest first and then this quest and then this quest because they're all timed. Like, no, there's not really actually very few. Um, they're very manageable. Uh, yeah, it's, it's... Don't worry about it. <laughs> so It's basically just uh, common sense. Like, yeah. if, is there something that seems like it might be important to do as soon as possible? Then you should probably like prioritize that. And, and the game will, it. and in some cases, the game will just tell you. Like I ran into a quest. I, I, I hope I hope we're not spoiling too much. I think we're trying. We're being vague enough. I think. No, as as the resident me and, and Chow, having not played Dragon Sogma, I feel like you guys have not told me anything outside of just generalities about how but quests there's, work. So can there's I, literally can I say a quest. One thing, just, oh, go just ahead. The way you're describing this. So at the risk of stop, you know that meme where it's like guy has who's only seen one movie, Boss Baby, seen yes. another movie. This gives me Boss Baby vibes. I feel like I'm risking that comparison by just bringing up Elden Ring again. But when Elden Ring um, first came out, and there was a few journalists, I think it was Schreier, I forget, saying yeah. like, "Hey, the way quests in the arc in this game, you better have a notebook." Um, no, you don't need, and that you was really maybe need. that was that, that was maybe overstated a little bit, but just the idea of the vagueness. Of the quest not being like waypointed in terms of like objective one, go here, objective two, defeat this thing, objective three, wait to, to you know, it feels like just the quests are a lot more like what information do you have? Where what places have you been? Player, you have an option here, sort of thing. So I just in in that point, I the way you're describing it yeah. gives me I'm looking forward to playing this game so that I can actually like make the comparison from a point of no, understanding I think, rather than ignorance. No, I think that's fair. Um yeah. I don't think you really need a notebook because it's not like that intricate, but it's, yeah, it's, you, it really depends on this. Are you, are you paying attention? Are you observant to like people you talk to? Anyways, all I was going to say was I, I ran into one quest, which was a timed quest. And it was like quite literally help. My husband is fighting uh, monsters over in this region of the map. Please save them. So, I mean, if you want, you can be like, okay, I will, like, in a week. But if you, if you wait, they're going to die. And the game, literally, this is one of the points where the game will actually label it in your quest log. Like, this is timed. So, like, okay, okay. Yeah, you, you better the go there <laughs> before, you know, you can't just wait on them. So, it, it, my point is, is that you don't have to be worried about, like, I oh, how, how do I put this? You don't have to be worried about being overwhelmed with all these, like, deadlines. Uh, but there are going to be, unless you're like, you're, you're probably not going to get great, excellent outcomes on everything if you do this organically the first time through. It's really just not designed like that. So, and that's fine, you know. Yeah. Like, <laughs> that, it, it, like I, w I would say, don't be afraid of failure in these types of games. I mean, my yeah. first Dragon's Dogma fucking playthrough was just, <laughs> it was a Dra shit oh, show. Dragon's Dogma <laughs> One is way worse in terms of uh, 
you better do these quests now or else they get locked off later. This game is actually quite a bit more forgiving with that. In fact, I don't know if any, there might be only a few small quests that are like locked off if you don't do them soon enough. Like, yeah, like really small stuff. Like one of the very first quests you'll run into in Melv is a girl who wants to buy a medicine. And I think you probably could skip that quest, but it's also so easy that like it really doesn't matter. But yeah. Um, so I guess like, you know, we, we got, we, yeah, we got, we could talk about a little bit about the world, just a general overview, but yeah, but in terms of like, I think the, the first thing that I guess existing Dragon's Dogma one players will notice in this game compared to the first game is your starting vocations where you still have fighter and mage, but they split up Shrider into both thief and archer now. And I meant thief, uh, for my playthrough and I'm really going to be sad when I have to when I when I switch to another vocation to get their augment skills which are, are skills that you can take over to other vocations because I'm already having a fucking blast with that is a fun vocation. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm interested it's like what were your initial vocations and then as you unlock more did you switch on over the general like what was your gameplay experience? So I that? started with fighter and yeah. mainly I did it so I could get their augment that makes their they can carry more. So I'm like, mm -hmm. I want to carry more. Um good. But also they, you know, they get some like defense skills and whatnot, augments. And then after I finished Fighter, I changed to Archer. Uh I like Archer as like an exploration class, uh because like whenever you get attacked by wolves or goblins or whatever. I don't really have to worry about like running up to them or whatnot. I can kind of just like flip arrows all the time and pick them out. And they're pretty weak. So it's kind of nice just to kind of do that when I'm exploring. I have messed with some of the magic classes a little bit. Again, mostly to get some of their like, this augment boosts your magic defense. Like, oh, that'll probably be useful. Um, and I haven't actually done much with Thief yet at all. I don't even know. Like, is there a good Thief augment? I don't know. I haven't really looked. Yes, it has a strength augment for it. Oh, it does have another strength uh, augment. Yeah, and I, I believe. That. Uh, well, I don't know off the top of my head, but like I do know that Thief has good augments, and I also know that Thief itself is just like kind of broken. <laughs> it's, it's a really, really good powerful. class. Like it also has like if you like climbing on monsters, it also like reduces the amount of stamina you um, consume while gripping onto a monster. As one of its augments, um, I love I love that class. It's kind of interesting you... because they, they 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 transfer over some of Dragon Dogma's ones assassin Fire. skills over to Thief or assassin. Okay, yeah, assassin. It, it's kind of really good. Like Scarlet Kisses, like that that. Rapid slash is like one of its score skills. You just kind of get that for free. Um, um, I know that thief. Uh, I think it might be a Meister skill. It might not. Is has that like kind of like a uh, rope thing that you can use to kind of like pull a monster. Uh, uh, that, that, so that, when I was uh, skills, you can just. It's not a Meister one, but yeah, okay, it's yeah. a really good one. That's yeah, the, uh, I know that uh, pre-release when I was playing through um, the game and kind of like talking with uh, some other folks, like Cosma, for example. Mm -hmm. um, uh, he was saying how he used that like rope skill as a Drake was kind of flying over some water. And he said that that staggered it. So it fell in the water and he had b just barely started to fight and was like, oh, well, I guess it's dead now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a very, very good skill because like, you could just like kind of like if there's harpies around, you can just pull them on over. And then when they're when they're on the ground, if you do a heavy attack, it actually like a massive damage, like double stab with its twin daggers. So it's it's there, very good. But yeah, Thief has been fantastic. I've been loving it. I also want to mention that changing vocations is pretty easy in this game. The only slight annoyance with it is that you have to change your equipment because a lot of armor is only for certain certain vocations. But that's not too bad. And you actually gain like vocation levels pretty fast. Like it's not like nothing, but it's like if I've never touched Thief. If I wanted to, like, test out Thief, it's pretty easy for me to equip some Thief gear, go out in the world, fight some enemies, and within half an hour, I'll probably gain some vocation levels and get some of those augments started. It It's pretty easy to kind of yeah. just experiment and try things. Um, and then I can turn it back into my Archer or whatever class and bring some of those augments over. Um, like the Strength one, that's, I should probably get that one. That seems just useful in general. Um, but it's and this how do I put been... this? I think Dragon's Dogma Two. Once you kind, of, it's a it's actually a pretty 
it doesn't how do, how do I put this? It's a pretty it's easy a game to play. Game. <laughs> once you get once you get used to it, it's like I feel like Dragon's Dogma One always kind of felt kind of you know you kind of had to like fight against the controls or um, I felt like it was just a little bit stiff in how to control it and play it and that it was you, you kind of had to get used to it a little bit. I think Dragon's Dogma Two is quite a bit easier to kind of get into. Maybe some of the pawn stuff is a little bit more confusing, but I think Dragon's Dogma Two once you kind of you know, get into the swing of things. It's pretty easy to like just play for hours and hours and hours. So I think the, I think the early game definitely is a lot way more smooth in Dragon's Dogma too compared to the first Dragon's Dogma because Dragon's Dogma you had like that uh, coastal village and then you had like that that small narrow road to like the the encampment. I'll, I'll always remember that because okay. it's kind of like your first like wake up call very early on. It's like oh this game doesn't fuck around. <laughs> you know, and then and then you get and then you do the the encampment to the to the journey to Grand Soren after. I also know. feel like Dragon's Dogma two. So when I was going into this game, I I don't know why I had like a Souls like or a Neo mindset where I was like, mm. oh god, I got to be really careful. Even a goblin can fuck me up if I'm not careful. But the game is not that punishing. Goblins suck. You'll be able to beat goblins. No 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 problem. They they're kind of pathetic. Um, the game is not that difficult. Um, I think it has a pretty good like curve in that the very first Cyclops you meet might feel kind of dangerous, but once you sort of you know spend just a little bit of time realizing, oh, this is how you fight a Cyclops, they end up being no no big deal, and it it's not that hard of a game. Like yeah, even you... even for newcomers, don't I, yeah. would, I would say don't feel deterred by like. It on a difficulty level, obviously you can like if if it comes to like deterrence because of performance, then we'll we'll have that discussion in a bit. Yeah, so th that's very understandable. Um, and you have you have but, three pawns helping you out, so it's not like yeah. a solo thing. So exactly. you can rely a lot on them. Yeah, um, but I I think also we kind of touched upon this in previews of Dragon of Dragon's Dogma too. But in terms of like you don't if you're coming into this from Dragon's Dogma one with that mentality of like oh do I need to like. Uh, go down a certain vocation path for min maxing stats. It's like uh, you don't have to worry about that anymore because when you switch vocation, my understanding is like you just adapt that vocation stats as if like you were you reached that level with that vocation in the first place. So like your stats are reallocated on the fly either way. Yeah, I was um, kind of curious see. about this. It was hard. It was hard to suss out, but like it seems like the stats you gain upon level up do change a little bit depending on your vocation. And I wasn't sure if like. When you change vocation, it's as if you leveled up as that class. I'm not sure, but really, if I, from my experience, you don't need to worry about it too much. Even if I I haven't played that much as a magic character, but if I were to change to a magic character now, I would still be pretty darn effective. Like it's not like I'm like, oh, I never trained up my magic, so my magic characters will suck for the rest of my playthrough. No, it's not really like that. You don't need to worry about it. You can just. I honestly think just change vocations whenever you want. Just do what you want. You don't need to worry about it. Are there are there difficulty levels? No, no. Which no. I think the, which is okay. kind of interesting because the original game had easy, normal, and I think like a hard mode, which is actually sort of different. Um, but this game doesn't. Just one difficulty. Yeah. Um. But I, I, yeah, I mean. Combat in general is, you know, it's pretty much as you remember it from the first Dragon's Dama. There's, a, it, it, it's like it feels, it feels a lot nicer than the first one. I never figured out how to lock on. I don't think there's a lock on. I never. <laughs> it's a joke. It was a joke. Oh, there's a okay. lock on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like huh? it's like I tweeted out this uh, one uh, like uh, thing I caught on a uh, resetter with someone was like, oh, "Where's the lock on?" And it's like Dragon's Dogma is so fucking back. <laughs> Um. Yeah. Uh. But I think I think the if anything, the like, takeaway for the combat of this game is like it feels a, a slightly more heavier than the first game from what I remember of it, which is good. I I like it. I like the the, the slightly more heavier combat. Um. Have you ever been drop kicked by an ogre? Uh. I yes. I, I I mean I didn't get hit, but I saw it. I was on it as it as it did the drop kick, and I was like, oh, <laughs> I got hit I, once. Oh, I survived. Playing. Clinging onto an ogre is really funny in this game because when you're on its back, it'll try to do like that, like back slam. But if you're on it, you'll get your your you will ragdoll physic up into the air so fucking high, <laughs> and it won't it won't actually kill you because oddly enough, when you're in that state, you'd receive way less falling damage than like normally you would yeah. uh, the normal falling damage, which is very funny. 
So you can get up to like really ridiculously high places if you like kind of do some really high IQ positioning. That um, ogres are very funny in this game, just like the first game. Um, so you can go read uh, James's review of Dragon's Dogma Two up on the site. Excellent, excellent review. Uh, definitely recommend it. Uh, you also released a, a, a supplementary feature on that, uh, kind of just breaking the news to people that hey, if you're planning to play this game on Steam Deck, it's gonna be a no go. It's way too intensive on that device. It's pretty much unplayable. Yeah, we should, I guess we should talk about performance. Um, yeah, a bit. yeah. So um, Steam Deck, I gather, is pretty much just a no go. Yeah, no, it's a no go. Uh, most handheld gaming PCs, for that matter, because it's not just an issue with like the CPU and the GPU, but also the RAM. Mm. And most handheld gaming PCs only have 16 gigabytes of RAM. This game, at absolute minimum settings, uses a minimum of uh, 18 gigabytes between system RAM and uh, system RAM and uh, video RAM. Oh wow! So, so it's. So I uh, think I think a lot of us here have pretty good PCs. Of varying levels, yeah. but we're all like at least I think all of our PCs are within the last like five four years, you know, pretty good. Yeah, uh, yeah I know this, that this I game is that, uh... this game is a very it's gotten a bit of flack for its performance and nuts and bolts here. A lot of it has to do with the city of Vernworth, and Capcom has said this outright. It's it's basically because of all the different like NPC interactions in that city that re requires a big CPU load. So this game is very CPU intensive. So even if you have a really monster video card, which, you know, helps in other cases, in other situations, that city, its performance is going to be dictated quite significantly based on your CPU. Uh, well, I no modern have, PCs, even if you have absolute like high CPU, yeah. even if you have like the like absolute best specs, it still won't run it smoothly. Yeah, so I have uh, a I have an AMD Ryzen 5900X, which I think is like three four years old so it's not like old but it's not new and in us in this city i get dips under 30 fps and it's pretty choppy at times mm -hmm. um now when i'm outside of the city no problem at all it's totally fine i don't even think about it but the city i kind of just with my pc which is you know within the last five years i have to basically just sort of accept this game does not perform well in the city i kind of just have to go in go out and get what i get what i need done while it's a little bit choppy it's still it's still um, playable. I was gonna say, I, but it's just it's very intense. Yeah, I saw people joking about that. Like, like, well, we just better go on an NPC killing spree and just kill them all, and then then it'll perform better. I, I think I, I uh, think I, I can understand like people's frustrations with this too, because like it, like when when Capcom says it's about the about the AI routines and AI interactions uh, uh, throughout NPCs throughout the city, like for some people, like the draw like the draw distance of NPCs aren't isn't that great in general, even in the city, like. So it, I I can understand the frustration that like from like a, a basic understanding of like an outsider's perspective like why are they say why, why is it taking so much like CPU load to make the game run shittier if like I can barely see like not many NPCs at like any given time um just basically running around right because like the draw distance on the NPCs in that city aren't you by by and large aren't great like you know you don't you don't really see that many NPCs in one place at one like time in the frame of that. So I can understand like why people are like frustrated with uh, with that, that situation. I think the bigger thing that a lot of people um, suffer is like that that the game is just like it just in some setups. I don't know there's something that's, like I don't know exactly where the issue is and people are still investigating it. Of like this game will just like even on like decent specs will just like art is unplayable. It'll crash often. It'll it's like it's just not looking good for a good chunk of people who have like certain setups. That, like this game is literally unplayable. You cannot just it, it won't stop crashing like after like fifteen to twenty minutes at a time for for some people, which that sucks. Uh, and then there's like not something new. Like I was mentioning it to Brian before the podcast that like you know this is kind of the Jedi Survivor and Wild Hearts of like of last year where those games shipped and for a good chunk of people was very in a very unacceptable state. Um, well, I remember a couple of weeks ago we were saying like at least we haven't had any like performance dogs this year, <laughs> and then yeah. all of a sudden Dragon's Dogma Two. Yeah, so hopefully Capcom is gonna fix those issues ASAP, and hopefully find some way to make the the city performance uh, better by and large for a lot of people. I, I've known some some of my friends, you know, have to like forcibly upgrade their PCs last minute after seeing their performance. Like some of them like 
bought like eight hundred eight hundred dollars worth of like new PC parts. Um, that to... that I I would say though that in like your case, like wasn't one of your buddies like using like a four core four thread? CPU yeah, yeah, that? he had a very ancient CPU. Yeah, so, so so like in that like uh, like obviously this game's performance. Yeah. Can and should be better, uh, but I think in a case like that, where it's like, yeah. okay, that's a CPU that's like a decade old. It's yeah, like, he's oh. it's a very like like he was, he was showing us how his game looked. Uh, just running that, it looked like a PS One D master of the game. It was very pixelated. It was very, you know. I guess you could see some models. <laughs> yeah, and I guess uh, I guess the main thing about this game's performance is noteworthy is that for the majority of players, you're not going to be able to lower settings enough to really stabilize performance in the city. And yeah. like even and even though we're saying that like outside the city performance is a lot better, which is true, it's still probably a little bit more cpu heavy than some people yeah. are probably mm -hmm. ready for yeah it's a it's, it's a very you know in, in a few years what time, I would say, yeah it'll, what I, it'll straighten out yeah if, if not yeah if not because of patches if because of cpus getting better which uh i guess i'll say right now um maybe if you have an older cpu and you're looking to play monster hunter wilds you should maybe start considering when you're going to want to upgrade <laughs> Yeah, if because this game's any indication. Yeah, you mentioned uh, that you know the, when Monster Hunter World first launched on PC, that was that, yeah. People that was forget a, a very, that was very big struggle. Yeah, that was like a very like intensive game to run at the time, like even on the CPU. But it was like one of those cases where, well, like the CPUs in like the PS4 and the Xbox One, even at launch, were so much weaker than stuff you could get on PC. Uh, that wasn't the case for the PlayStation 5 and the Xbox uh, Series X and S. So uh, anything that would like actually be like stressing the CPU, like inevitably something like this was going to happen. And like I even have tweets from back in like 2020 where I said said as much where it's like, hey, uh, maybe people should be prepared for this inevitability. And it's like, well, finally happened. <laughs> finally happened and, yeah and, and then the, the, the dragon's dogma 2 uh the state of consoles on it is like I, I i forgot that they mentioned this but it's not it's not targeting 30 fps it's an un uncapped frame rate that you can that and you can't even set a 30 fps cap on that so yeah the, the the state of it on consoles is pretty kind of all over the place i would say because it, it can't maintain a stable frame rate because it is for it is forced uncapped if i understand correctly yeah okay so that that you'll you know you'll be running maybe forty to forty five fps out like in the wilderness in some cases on consoles, but then like once you reach that city, it could they could dip pretty hard and it's well, and the, that, the, that's a, I'd say that's a good thing though because mm -hmm. it means that when like uh, not when the PS five Pro comes out unfortunately because mm -hmm. CPU, yeah. uh, but when the P PlayStation six hits like you can play Dragon's Dogma two and immediately it's like oh man this is locking to sixty fps this is like a free remaster. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, I I think there's you know they, they should definitely consider putting an like optional 30, cap yeah, yeah yeah optional 30 fps cap for sure um and also I, I guess move it like you know going on like when this when this game hit on Steam and in uh, and on consoles immediately there's like a shit ton of DLC coming out with this game like you see it's like when you when, when it launched you see you open up that DLC list it is. A massive amount, and for a lot of so, I, and I think about I, I think of this in two ways because for the common outsider who doesn't know about Dragon's Dogma at all, this will kind of feel sort of scummy on the surface because they don't know much about it. Like it's like what they're they're charging three bucks for fast travel, and they're charging however much for to for to edit my character again. They don't make um, any outrage video talking about this, but the thing is, yeah. uh, this is a new practice for Capcom. Capcom's been doing this since like Devil May Cry Five. It's like no, here, no, they, they did this Devil for the, <laughs> They did this for the original Dragon Dogma, which makes everyone freaking out about it like even more funny because yeah, it's not great that the microtransactions yeah. are there, but here can I say been... something? Go for it. Right, go. Go ahead. Sorry, I know I just butted in there, but the oh. main reason why a lot of reviewers us included didn't like specifically mention microtransactions even though yes we were aware of them but the main reason why we didn't mention them is because they are so inconsequential 
that we forgot. Like, yeah. seriously, then, yeah. we're playing the game. We play for 70 hours or whatever. And it's like, oh, man, this game is really cool. Let's talk about it. The last thing we're thinking about is, oh, yeah, in the review doc, I saw there were microtransactions. Like, we, you know, they're, they're, they're pointless. They're inconsequential. They don't matter. You don't need them. They're, we and literally you guys are playing it, but you, yeah, you guys we didn't are playing have access to them. any of it. No, yeah. we didn't have yeah, access yeah. to them. So. Yeah, and to put in perspective, it's like obviously I had a tweet that kind of blew up where I was like, "Yeah, so they're selling this 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 jail key, but the one and only time I got jailed, I just like kind of broke some boxes and I found a key right there." And then like somebody responded saying, "Oh, when I was when I got jailed, I I looked uh, behind me and I realized that some of the uh, bricks in the uh, jail wall were loose, so I just hit it and I was able to walk right out." So it's like. There is an argument to be made that the fact that these uh, DLC items are as pointless as yeah. they are makes it worse because it's just yes. preying on people that don't know any better. Yeah, and I agree yeah. with that. I agree, I agree with that. Absolutely. And, and, and I should also mention that like we're, we have criticized this sort of stuff on this podcast before. It might have been even just last week where we're like, man, Atlas and Sega have a bunch of crappy DLC because they do. Yeah. And it's arguably worse because it's like New Game Plus. Is hide be- hidden behind a special edition. And I think it's, it's to make that distinction, boss. right? It, it, like it's a distinction between like we acknowledge that like on its face, like selling this kind of microtransactions to kind of trick people into like getting more money out of them is an abhorrent practice for sure, absolutely ten thousand percent. But it's all, but it's also make that distinction between like you spread that message that like all this DLC or all this all these things that they're making you that not making you pay for that they're offering is in the game already. So it's not like exclusively offered as DLC is like, there's the only option to like access it. It's like, no, that's factually incorrect. Uh, where like you can access all of this in game very, very early on. The only, yeah, the I only do. thing I'll get, I'll give people that I, I agree with, like they should offer a new game option yeah, that instead of like weird. locking you. Yeah. But, yeah oh, instead yeah. Of locking Speaking you into of that, um, so, Tying in a couple of the last conversation points, Capcom did release a message on the Steam forums. Yeah. It's pretty high level because it was basically released the day of the release date on the 22nd, basically saying they're trying to investigate crashes and bugs. So not explicitly frame rate, but people who can't play the game at all. Yeah. Um, they are looking at investigating options for starting a new game. Um, and then they do say they're trying to identify ways to improve frame rate. Um, so no, no, no concrete details, but just saying like, Hey, we we acknowledge this and we're going to see what we, um, can do about it. You know what? Yeah. One small thing I really think they should do. This mm. is actually exactly how the first dragon's dogma worked, but I'm not surprised at all that people are confused about this. The save game, um, mm. you have your like normal save and then you have your in save and it, let's just say you in saved and you played for 10 hours out in the world. And let's just say you weren't quite sure you're loading your game and you load your in save, you just lost that 10 hours of progress um, because your in save is like a hard checkpoint that you make. Whereas your normal save that you get out in the world and whatnot is um, kind of separate. It's like a separate thing. And if the game, I don't think the menu is very clear. It does like warn you, like you might lose progress, but I think something they could add is tell you like, how, you made the save like 10 hours ago. Yeah, how like long ago was your in save compared yeah. to your normal save? Like, that, yeah, this was done fair. when you had 23 hours in the game, where your normal save is at 29 hours in the game, to at least just kind of give you a heads up, like, hey, are you sure you want to do this? Now, once you understand how the save system works, it is useful in that um, you can have the one checkpoint save so that if you know you're going to be doing something that you want to save scum a little bit in terms of like, I don't There's know the outcome a, here. You can sort of play a good around example with it. of that is uh, like the Sphinx. Yeah. Like if you're trying to answer her riddles and it's like, okay, uh, I think this is right, but I'm not happy. I'm not taking any chances. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So uh, it's just. Uh, there's a lot of confusion uh, around the game in that aspect, and we might clear up a little bit of it because uh, it's understandable where people like who are looking at it and never engage with Dragon's Dogma at all. And on its surface, it could, you know, if you're just kind of taking everything at face value, it could it could seem like kind of crazy what they're doing. But it's like no, there's a, there's more to this uh, than would like you know what my, some people might lead you to believe. So 
I it's it kind of it really bugs me out. It really bugs me out that like they 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 still offer these things as like DLC to kind yeah. of trick people into them. Like uh, here's still, an, here's an example. Like you, one of the things that you can buy, you kind of joked at it before, is a port crystal, which I think it's three dollars. Mm-hmm. But you can find port crystals in the game, and what a port crystal is is basically like a point that you can warp to. You set it down somewhere, and then it's like becomes a warp point. I think I have found like four or five in the game where I'm at, and I I have not used all of them. I've been like I put one in the checkpoint town, which you can get to through ox carts anyway. But I put one there just so I can get there from anywhere. I put one in the elf town. I put one in the batal town, um, and I think that's it. Like I've used. And, 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 yeah, oh, I put one. Can, I put one can, in the you can Pick these up. You can yeah, pick up these port crystals and like and yeah, yeah. yeah. So, for ex- and, for example, and, and, like change it too. Yeah, yeah, for an example, like uh, I had a port crystal at where the Sphinx is. Yeah, then so, like, you pick it up when so you're you done. Go, yeah, you pick it up when you're done. It's like, I think, and obviously different uh, players are going to ha- run into like different like quests and have different rewards. I've seen some people say that they only got the one port crystal when they were playing the game for like 70 hours. I got like five. Yeah. And honestly, like... I never used all of them all at once, really. <laughs> So. Yeah, and it's like, is there any pl- is there enough places in the game after done with the Sphinx stuff, anyways, where you would actually have a need to use five different port crystals at once? Let me see. Because like Elf Place, the tall, you could put one at the checkpoint town, even though you can get there through an ox cart. Um, yeah, and it doesn't make it doesn't so like checkpoint town does doesn't seem like it would even really be worth it because it, like again ox cart. Yeah, you could. The, the only I I do have one there, but that's just so I can warp there from anywhere. Um, but you could always just warp to Vernworth and then Oxcart over. So it's like you don't even need one there. Um, yeah. And then like I don't know. My 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 whole point is is that like you can buy an extra one, sure, but you really don't need it. I also have like yeah, and you still 20... need to and you still need. And you still say, need to get the fairy stones to use it. So. Right, and I have like twenty wake stones now. Like but that I've gotten naturally, and you can buy like five more or something like that for like a dollar each. It's just you don't need them; you get plenty. So that's the, that's that's kind of the thing is they're so inconsequential that like they don't matter. But people, yeah, they, it sucks that it's there. We've criticized it. It's just it's, but at least it's not like hiding away something that you can't get otherwise. Yeah, it's so, like it's, again it's, if if. Uh, like I do not disagree with the people that say that oh it's worse because that that it's like completely inconsequential because then it's like just preying on people that don't know any better. Mm-hmm. I understand that that makes sense, uh, but yeah, I guess what we're what trying to say about, is, is about that the, it's, uh, it was tac- it was it was very clearly tacked onto the game, and you can just play the game normally. And honestly, if you're playing offline you wouldn't even know that you could buy the DLC because it just doesn't like get in the yeah. way of the experience. What were you saying, Brian? Cool. Just like, there were some memes, like I forget if it was, it's, you know, or one of the creative directors saying like, we just need to make travel interesting. And then people put up the fast travel port as like, he, he gotcha. But it seems like there's really no meat to that. It's no, just a, you oh, just get one extra yeah. port crystal. Which you really don't need. <laughs> it, it, it's just like you know, it, it's it's kind of it's kind of fucked up in, in in two ways, right? Right? Because it's like it's 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 misinformation, and then that, through that spread of misinformation, you're misin it, it all it'll misinform someone to further spread misinformation on like what based on what they received as well. So, and based no, on the way you I'm, describe the game, you're basically saying exploration like is incredibly you know engaging and fun in this game. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. I have actually, I, 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 I've been kind of a, I've been kind of a hoarder for fairy stones. Like I could warp to the elf place right now, but you know what? I'm just gonna walk because I don't want to use a fairy stone. <laughs> so yeah. You know, I, I was gonna say, I was trying to think of like a time this happened back in. Do you remember Bravely Default with their SP system? Uh, yeah. Or, or the yeah. and you had to spend like extra dollar if you want to get that refilled instantly, and people were trying to get outraged about that, and then they tell them it's like, but the outrage seems very fast to die down compared to like how the internet is nowadays 
It's like they don't want they want to double down about this whole microtransaction thing. Well, I mean, oh. like whatever the next Tales game releases, they're gonna have a million DLCs for money and gold oh, or whatever. Yeah, it's yeah, just, no it's just it sucks. We're not saying yeah, this is good. It's just like that's just. It's oh, just like, stuff that you're in, not gonna. In, in, in a perfect world, this practice wouldn't even exist, especially yeah. on a seven seventy dollar full price game. You know. Yeah, it's uh, true. But like these companies are just kind of looking at it. It's like mm, it'll be like extra free money to the the people that doesn't know. You know, that's kind of like how they're doing it. It's scummy, uh, but at the uh, same time, it's to us. It'll be like we're not even gonna you touch it at all. It just it just happens to be there. Yeah, and trail yeah. games always have a bunch of like you know things that are like just money and. In- uh, items. Yeah, and spend three dollars for a shining palm pack. Yeah, yeah so like, levels. are you gonna spend that three dollars for those three extra levels? I can't think of anyone that goes out of their way to do that. No, uh, pay, to play, pay, pay to play the game less. You know, <laughs> it, like it's there, but it's like it's not like things I would notice. Like I don't in my guides for the trails games. I don't even have a DLC section. I don't even know what the fuck is in there. Yeah, you know, that's for me, right? Yep. But yeah, it's just but yeah. So I think we're all on yeah. the same so page. It, it kind of sucks also, that it's there, but it's you. We literally forgot about it when we were playing it. Like that's why we didn't talk about it. It it, it sounds like it's kind of like devil. You don't know. Like with, deciding which is worse might be a pointless argument. But if the game was unfun, and then it's like, oh, you can you can kind of grease the wheels a bit if you if you buy a convenience item. But you're saying like, no, the game is plenty fun. But, I can ignore this. The, <laughs> the, 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 there's also like. Uh, how do I say this? Uh, also, the game doesn't like push it in front of you as you're playing the game too. It's not saying, "Hey, you can you can buy more port crystals if you're like using one in the game." It's like you can buy more port crystals for like oh, X amount of dollars. Like, remember, it's, it's, not like, it's, not like, it's not like it's not like you uh, set up a camp in uh, Dragon's Dogma two, and then literally one of the menus there is, "Hey, do you want to buy DLC?" Okay, Thanks, yeah, Tales of Arise. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Was it was it was it a uh, Dragon Age two or three? Or uh, I'm trying to think. Like it was around that time frame where it was like you speak to a character and in their dialogue tree it would have like this is a microtransaction right here if you pick this up. Oh option. my god! <laughs> I forgot about. <laughs> I don't remember which game it was, but wow. I remember it being like this is a you know this. Maybe it was Mass Effect 3 Javik or something, but it was, I think it was one of those, that era of, you know, 2010s. What was, well. what was Javik yeah. again? Was, did you actually have to pay for him or was he like pre order? Do you remember? So it, weird. It, no, it, it was, it was the, um, it was that initiative. What did they call it? It was like if you bought a used copy of the game, you had to pay extra. Oh, I for... remember this. The, uh, like the yeah. new game lock. Thing, whatever, like, like, thing or whatever. The, uh, yeah. like the online pass or whatever. Yeah. Oh man, that yeah. was a fun year. If you bought, if you bought a retail copy, you got it. Yeah, that was that was a that was an era <laughs> for about <laughs> okay. a year and a half. Yeah, to, Anyways, to date exactly when that was uh, the zeitgeist. I remember like pretty much all of like Sony's like actual first party Vita exclusives of multiplayer had like uh, online passes. <laughs> Every single one. I I remember uh, like a, a friend of mine like uh, when playing Uncharted three like he like he bought a used copy of Uncharted three and he thought he thought he had to pay for the uh, the online pass to like play the single player of it so he did. <sighs> man, God, fuck, fuck God. man, yeah. that was... man, he he should have just man like Uncharted three multiplayer sucks. He would have been better off just God. Yeah, it was uh, uh that that upset me. Upset me when I heard. <laughs> it's like, well, this is how they get you. <laughs> That's how they got you. So that I mean, reminds me of how I had a roommate, and like two years after the Xbox One came out, he brought a, a used game to GameStop and asked if there was anything special he needed to do to trade it in. It's like, oh. <laughs> uh. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, Dragon's Dogma too. Uh, Shame, shame you have to have a fantastic, fantastic game like from where I'm at and, you know, all the people who seem to come through, uh, play through it seem to, you know, be fairly united saying it's a really, really fascinating game. Um, you know, hopefully they fix up performance on all platforms, uh, make it run better, obviously fix the crashes that a lot of people are having. And, you know, don't, don't get fooled by these fucking microtransactions. They're, they're, they're going to keep on coming for future games. Don't get fooled, you know. It's, uh, it's a, it's a fucked up situation. Just know that, like, you you don't do not feel pressured or forced to buy into it. 
Well, I think it's that's kind of covers the gamut for all the things to talk about for Dragon's Dogma 2, your experience with the game, the combat, the issues with the performance, discussion around the microtransactions. Uh, obviously, like I've said a couple times, very eager to get to this. I I know I missed last week. Again, I, I apologize for that. Just some real life things came up. I did also I did finish Thaumaturge, and I'm most of the way through Unicorn, which I believe you spent last week talking about uh, Unicorn Overlord. A little bit. A little bit. It was last week was kind of a yeah, weird week. Don't... We were talking about like beta tests. So, oh yeah, that's right. I was like, there's, 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 there's more beta tests uh, in the news this week. But before we go into the news, uh, we have the other game that released on the same day, and that Princess of Peach. course is yes, Prince, Princess Peach. Um, Princess Peach Showtime. We of... should we should we should ping Paige see if she she would she's awake and would want to start talking about Paige? that. Paige or Paul would be really interested. In I think Paul game. just wants to buy it for uh, his daughter. I think or his son. I don't know. Mm-hmm. But I don't know. He seemed to really enjoy it when he played. Uh, what was it? Paper Mario games. Uh, yeah. With yeah. His kids. I think I said this but, before, but like he he has like young children. I don't. I think he has three children. I forget if they're boys or girls. But uh, saw him, brought him to the Mario movie, and now they're like they were Mario obsessed. So. <laughs> but we are going to talk about Rise of the Ronin. Of course, this is the open world Souls like from Team Ninja from the Neo team. Uh, came out as exclusive on console at the moment, and. We have a review up on the site from our very own Josh Torres for Rise of the Ronin. So we will switch gears and talk about this other open world RPG that released. Yeah. At the time of recording. The, the, there's a Neo like, not a Souls like. Mm. Oh, I, I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I didn't. I didn't put any of those uh, monikers in, in my review. <laughs> you um, are you are a stronger. Didn't man you than you didn't use the Koei Tecmo uh, coined Maso Core? Oh, so God, I forgot they did that. That's right. Ugh. So Rise of the Ronin is uh, the, the next game from the, the Neo team. Um, I, I believe Voldong was done from, like, uh, from, like newer members. Uh, to, that's kind of, mm-hmm. like, their kind of springing off point of, like, you know, getting more, their feet wet into game development. So Rise, Rise of the Ronin is a really, really fascinating game because, especially at releasing at the same time as Dragon's Dogma 2, and I kind of mentioned it here and there um, as I was playing it, but this is definitely on the opposite end of the spectrum uh, when it comes to open world game design. And, and I've seen, you know, some reviews call it outdated in that aspect because the way it, it handles its open world is very much guided signposting. While there isn't like Ubisoft towers, it does have a form of that, which I'll get into. But on its surface, Rise of the Ronin, unlike previous Team Ninja action RPGs, it's an obviously one of the selling points that distinguishes it right away is its open world design, uh, and also it's very grounded in the sense that it's set during the uh, the later years of the Bakumatsu period in Japan, um, and there's really no supernatural, mythical, or fantastical elements about it. And that's something I really wanted to drive home in my review. Unlike there, unlike the Team Ninja action RPGs in the past decade. You know, there's no magic system. It is a very human story that adheres, you know, per, like uh, adheres as much as it can to to history. It's not like super. It's not like a documentary, like play by play over like what happened in the Bakumatsu period. It's not like it's not like a pair of assassins went to go uh, try to uh, uh, assassinate Perry and then. He, he he was able to hold off against his own, and then a, 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 a ninja came to his rescue. And, you know, it's not like that's uh, happened so, in history. So, so I have a question <laughs> bouncing off of what you're saying. Yeah. So because there are no supernatural elements, when I think of, like, yeah. Neo or Wolong, uh-huh. there's a lot of creatures you fight in those games. Yes. If there are no supernatural elements, does that mean in, in Rise of the Ronin you're mostly fighting humans? Yeah, it's it's pretty much humans all the way through. You're fighting uh, like a lot of them are, are real historical figures that exist. I think the vast majority of the cast, I, I can't think of like many like original characters that were just made up for this game. Like a lot of these people really did exist in history. But the, the Blade Twins, your main character yeah. and your sort of like yeah. antagonist character, that's not a spoiler, that's the premise. No, those are yeah. original, right? Yeah, those those are original. I don't think there's the Veil also- Edge. A, a similar follow-up. This this might have been what a- Adam was trying to ask, but I just yeah. wasn't paying attention. But like yeah. in Neo and Wolong, there's kind of almost like 
they're, they're very stage based games, and you'll talk about the format of this game, uh, of Rise of the Ronin, I'm sure. But yeah. there's almost like there's two types of bosses there's the large boss, and then there's like the dual boss, which is where you fight another humanoid person. So, are all of the quote boss encounters, or I don't know if boss is even the right term, like are they all kind of duels in that sense? There, there are most of them are one on one duels. There are some that are that do have multiple bosses, like you know, facing off against you at the same time. Um, but through and through, they're all people. They're 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 not demons. They're not monsters. Uh, that doesn't mean that they don't have crazy move sets. Like in the later parts of the game, you do encounter some um, crazy things. I, 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 I'll slip in one just to get. Uh, I won't say who. But there's a person, uh, uh, that's a foreigner, a Western person, that they have like rocket boots on them. <laughs> it's like, and it's like, I guess, I mean, <laughs> sure, but they're still a person. They're still fighting them. They just have very unnatural moves, a move set. Uh, that, yeah, you know, why not? And it's like, so okay. what, rocket boots? What, next thing you're going to tell me, one of them drives a giant Gundam or something? I'm I'm not gonna say any more that like the 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 than that, but it sounds they, like a uh, Rido or something. I don't know. Um, but it, it's for people who really like that uh, that time period of like who really like samurai samurai type video games that like love like the weapon duels uh, and the dramatization of that. You know, like Ghost of Tsushima had this like when you had like very dramatic duels against other samurai in that game. Um, and you know, you see like the framing, the scenery, and it's like it's a very dramatic tension, uh, as, as people cross blades, uh, against one another. And, and this game very much follows, you know, in, in other samurai games, not just Ghost of Tsushima, but also like in Way of the Samurai, for example. Um, so the, the format of this game, after like a short tutorial, you go out into this open world, and much like FF7 Rebirth, there's like different open worlds because you have three different regions in this game of Yokohama, uh, Edo and Kyoto where you're explore you you have three different open worlds to like kind of explore and fill out uh, so if you desire and the this is uh, framed as like how, as i described in my review like Yokohama for example it, it is surrounded by like a dozen or so so zones i i frame it as zones because these uh, places like like in Kyoto, like Kanagawa by Kyoto, for example, these weren't prefectures yet in historical. Uh, like it was shortly after the end of the Bakumatsu period where they standardized these places as prefectures. So I wanted to be historically accurate, saying that like these aren't quite prefectures; they're not districts yet. These are just areas in the game that are segmented off. Um, and as you're traveling throughout them, you can, you don't activate like a Ubisoft tower. To show where all the things are immediately when you first wander into these zones um there's nothing that pops up in your map right away you encounter you can encounter as you're like well you know using your horse or like traveling on foot throughout these areas you'll encounter something that will raise the bottom level of this area so that could be like a fast travel point that you raise a banner in much like in neo and Mulan, where you like raise banner to like establish a checkpoint um or it could be like um Theory got like a, a a village that's been like raided by like bandits, and these like uh, you restore public order to them by like you know wiping them off, and so like like these are two like example activities that you can encounter in a zone. But just to be Go clear, through. just to be clear, I was re- I, I I read your review on this, and this is probably the part that was most like I don't want to say surprising maybe, but like I wasn't expecting it in that they literally call it a bond level with the map yeah where it's, where it's like you you start out not being able to see a lot of icons and and things on the map points of interest or whatnot and then as you kind of fill up your bond level with the map you get more and more of those and then eventually you get like a max map level if you will which you can basically see all the different collectible event doohickeys on the map but it is called a bond level right Yes, yeah, it's like okay. an area bond level or something like that. It's kind of it's like that's probably not what I would have called it, but like okay, I get it. I kind of get this. I feel like I've seen this sort of idea maybe somewhere else before, but I kind of get it. Okay, like you, you can see more and more about like what to do in this zone or the zones. Yeah, when you, so, like, yeah, as you do more in it. Okay. Yeah, so eventually you do like open more open world activities in it, and like you know, so like when you first establish like bond level one, you do like one thing, you'll see like oh, here's a there's a 
enemy encampment here, and there's here's like the fast travel banners here. So you go do them, um, and then you might you might raise a and then there might be another like an NPC in need that like you that you encounter along the way that you help them out. Eventually, you'll uh, raise it to bond level two, and then you'll see more things on the map. And then you'll do more open world activities in that zone. And then eventually to a max bond level three, then you'll see all the collectibles. You'll see where all the collectible cats are, all the shrines, all the treasure chests, and so forth. And then you'll see them exactly where they are in the map because when you hover over their, over their icons, you put a pin on it, it'll actually show, like, you know, uh, in game, like, hey, this is exactly where this treasure chest is or where this cat is. It's very guided. You know exactly where they are because you, you put a pin on it, it'll show up on your, uh, in your, like, in the game. And then you just have to figure out how you can, pla- like, if they're, like, on top of something, how do you platform over to them? Do I need to do the grappling hook on- onto them? Do I need to go to, like, some other nearby, like, roof that, like, uh, I can glide uh, off of to, like, get the right, right angle and approach to this thing? That's kind of the most figuring out you have to do. It's not it's not very, very uh, difficult either. It's, it's pretty simple to uh, to figure out. Um, and and that, that's kind of, like... Uh, I'll get into the good, the better parts of this game later, but I think I wanted to start with the weaker parts of this game where it's kind of a weird thing where the I, I assume a lot of the game's development time was spent in like what do we do for this open world and like how do we fill it out the activities because it's a big, big, big project for Team Ninja. And I I, I this is how I decided to like start my review, saying that like Rise of the Ronin must be like a landmark title for that studio because this is the first open world game in their three decades, uh, nearly three decades of like the studio's founding. So like, this is a very big change uh, compared to like other other games that they've uh, developed before, between fighting games, before these stage stage based action games like Ninja Gaiden, you know, and so forth. And I think it's a big bummer for Rise of the Ronin, where its open world, which is the big distinguishing feature for that studio with this title, is its weakest part because. There's just it, like as other outlets have stated, it feels outdated because there's not much variety in these what you're doing out of the open world. It's very much you've seen these before in other open world games. You've seen these activities of clearing out this enemy encampment to pacify it. Uh, you've seen this like you know find the fast travel points, find the collectibles, um, you know, and so forth. And the the only things that like the the only other activities that like pop up somewhat uh not not too often but in some zones there's like it's like horseback archery or firearm training or like hang glider challenges which is, like these activities you've kind of seen in other games maybe horseback archery not so much but like you know like hang gliding challenges you've seen variations of this i, you saw, I saw i saw, I saw when about. people first saw <laughs> the uh the hang gliding challenges they were like uh-huh. super mad 64 yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah you know um, but I, this is sort of like a really simple takeaway. I, I feel mm-hmm. like there's some truth to it, even if it is really simple. It's like, well, the, being an open world game was the component. If you were to break up a game into components, it was the component that was new to Rise of the Ronin and to this dev team. So I guess it's like yeah. maybe not yeah. that surprising that it's maybe a bit typical or not I, necessarily the strong suit, I guess. Yeah, I, 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 I kind of wish there was a problem. Yeah, I kind of wish there was like more like you know innovation like that, that like they they brought to the table. It's like oh, I haven't really seen this in much other open world games before. It's just, like if this was like the first open world game ever, it'd be feel like oh my god, it's a revelation. You know, <laughs> holy shit, video games are changed forever. This is like a landmark title. But no, we've we've had many 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 open world games come out before this game, right? And that's kind of and and of course those open world games have inspired the, the development of this game. Like, what are we gonna do about this open world? And so forth. So, in that sense, it can feel very monotonous and repetitive. You're trying to like fill out every single thing in this map, bond level with everything, get every collectible. I did that because I want to have a thorough playthrough of this game, and because you know when I see collectibles in a game and it's not like unreasonable to like get like every single one of them, I'll do it, and I did it. Um, so I think that's like kind of the the weakest part about this game. It's very it's it feels very samey. Even as you as you travel between like new open world maps in each region, you'll see the same type of activities. You'll you'll see somewhat newer environments, uh, but same activities for a buy in part, which is a bummer because I would like to see like more new activities, like maybe in some of these regions and so forth. Um, in terms of 
the narrative, I'll, I'll touch on the combat after this, but in terms of narrative, when I think about Team Ninja action RPGs, their narrative is sort of inconsistent. Neo had an interesting narrative. I don't think it was presented the best way, but it had an interesting narrative. Neo 2, pretty cool narrative, uh, but with the way they did your custom character and how they integrated it into that um, narrative. Yeah, um, like I, I, I've said before that I feel like uh, Neo 2's narrative is a little bit underrated. It's not amazing, yeah, yeah. but I think that it, it's genuinely like a pretty good story. Yeah, I, I dig it. Uh, Stranger of Paradise is a banger. <laughs> I'll just say it right now, a banger. <laughs> uh, I actually have a friend who literally made their pawn Jack Garland. I know, like, yeah, uh, I know that was sort of a meme, just saying like who you who you could create the creator, but they they actually just went for it. Their main pawn is Jack Garland. So yeah, chaos. <laughs> I caught it, you know. And then you had Wo Long, which I wasn't the biggest fan of, like how they treated the narrative. Um, it was kind of very lackluster. Um, but in uh, Rise of the Ronin, it's it's a it's a kind of really fascinating thing because as you're creating these two blade twins and how uh, one of them you kind of choose to be your main playable character, the other is a recurring antagonist. It they have their own personal arc, obviously, of trying to find their blade t- twin and understand like why they're doing the things that they're doing. That's kind of the basic story of your uh, of your original character in this game. But along the way in their journey. You kind of see the the, uh, the the events of the Bakumatsu period unfold uh, in front of you through that main char- through that main character. You see, you know, the Treaty of uh, Enmity being signed. You see, kind of the the rise of the Shinsengumi, how they form through the Roshigumi. Um, you kind of see how that how that the 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 through line of like between Showin's death to like the rise of the Yoshigumi and how the, like the kind of the anti and pro shogunate sentiment form as the western imperialism spread through japan because of the arrival of the black ships um you kind of see these threads being explored in the game almost like a historical drama um it's not it's not necessarily like done like in a like in a documentary form that you'd find on the history channel it's more so that like you get you kind of get up close and personal with these key figures in history kind of work through their thoughts and through interactions with other people around them saying like what is the best path for japan moving forward is it to embrace this isol this isolationism that um that has like kind of formed the identity of this country throughout countless years or should we open up borders and like let you know establish relationships with the western world and so forth and you kind of see these ideologies clash and it's nothing new that you've seen like in other films about the Bakumatsu period. And you've definitely like if you've read any of like history book about this, there's no, none of this info is new, you know. And we've and we've seen a lot of movies about this period, um, and 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 several interpretations and dramatizations about it. But I think it is uh, one of the best ways uh, presented in a video game uh, up to this point. And, and 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 like when you know narrative cutscenes are happening, you have the letterboxing to really kind of drive home the feeling that like, hey, this kind of like presented like a movie, like a historical drama sorts of thing. And it's very it, it's very slow going in the sense of like you got, you get up pretty close with like people's faces and their expressions as they're speaking with each other, talking about you know the current issues of that era and so forth. And it's kind of interesting because as you're meeting these people through your original character, you're establishing bonds with them. It's not just area bonds, it's also establishing bonds with people. And it's from every fucking faction in the game, from pro- pro-shogunate, anti-shogunate, and westerners, you know? You can have Perry as, like, you establish a bond with Perry, you know? My um, best friend Perry. I'm an you, can even establish, uh, you can even establish uh, a bond with the shogunate, and also with the uh, with the widow of the of the late of the of the last sh- shogun that you know um that passed away you know before the events of the game and so forth and it's like it's very bizarre because like you're sta- you're 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 establishing a friendship with them but also in some cases you can establish a romantic relationship with like people that existed in history <laughs> and it's like, like especially like for example for the widow for example it's like you know i think about like my late husband a lot but now you're like the most important person in my life it's like this is kind of weird 
<laughs> because like I I'd, I'd be okay if it was like a more it was a fictional character, but like this is kind of like you know it's kind of weird in that sense. Um, we don't go after the willow. There's a willow in Sakura Wars Free. Go after the willow. How to be? I mean, I mean, but did that person actually exist in history though? Were they a non-fictional no. character? Exactly. So, um, but uh, as you establish bonds with these people, it's not just like you know the interactions you have, but like there's a, a mechanical level of uh, interacting with these people and raising their bond level through gifts, through doing side quests with them, interacting with them, and so forth. You even have like a longhouse, uh, like a home base in the game throughout the regions, where like the people that you establish bonds with will just go in and out of like the longhouse. Like you'll go in there, it's like maybe it's like two to three people just chilling out there, and you can talk with them. You know, it's like this is weird. Why did why did you? I I I didn't. Okay, that's weird. <laughs> you just like I just go in there. And there's like there's like three grown men. From different factions, all chilling out of my house. I'm like, okay, I guess, sure. <laughs> um, and as you're leveling up these bonds, if, on a character by character basis, they'll give you different rewards. They might give you like a for combat, it's like a new like um, skill that you can use on one of your weapon styles uh, in the game, or you they might give you like a stat point uh, through like for strength, charisma, or tra- strength, charm, dexterity, or intellect. They might um, give you new equipment, new accessories uh, as you're leveling up you know, their bond levels. So there is a mechanical gameplay benefit to you know, interacting and raising their bond level. It's not, it's not as in-depth as like a social link in a persona, but you know, it, it, it helps uh, you in the long run, which is kind of like one of the... That's how the central pillar of the bond system is formed uh, in this game, where it's very much a human story, and you're interacting with these people in a very grounded setting. Um, in terms of, like, how combat is compared to, like, Neo and Wu Long, um, this, this, this combat system actually reminded me more a little bit on Neo fused with Way of the Samurai with a little bit of Wu Long's parry ideas, where it does have that responsive Neo combat of, hey, I, I'm my my goal in this fight is to uh, score critical hits by knocking down a, a person's key gauge. So we as you're key attacking, pulses, though. there is key pulses through the oh, blood okay. gauge, <laughs> but it's not it's not a free key pulse though. So the blood gauge is like as you're attacking with a weapon, there's like a little yellow bar that fills up underneath the weapon at the right, and then uh, at any time you can you can do a key pulse. But if, it's, if that that bar is full, you'll get the maximum amount of key back. From a key pulse, so you can't you can't free, freely key pulse, um, uh, dilly dally um, until, until you like you level up, put some points at like, hey, make my blood gauge uh, fill up faster, and I get more key back as I, you know, do a full blood gauge key pulse. You know, um, so, so so it's not as free as Neo, um, but in terms of like the goal of combat, as you're attacking, you're knocking down an enemy's maximum key until, like, eventually, you know, you can kind of uh, deplete their key entirely, score a critical hit, you do a lot of damage. For most, like, like you know, smaller enemies, you'll instantly kill them. Yeah, that, that sounds um, pretty familiar to Neo. Yep, yep that's pretty Neo. <laughs> and uh, along the way, as you're doing this, um, you can uh, switch uh, combat styles or weapon styles in uh, battle and this is kind of depicted in the game like by different like practices. Like the katana has like a lot of like weapon styles because there's a lot of like weapon schools of thought and katana, you know, stances and how the way you use swords stuff. Same thing with like, you know, dual swords, um, pole arms, spears, all different weapon styles based off of like most of them are based off of real practices that have in history. Some of them are made up for the game. Obviously, like the Hayabusa style for the katana is based off like ninja gaiden uh hayabusa yeah. or there's like the neo style um but then you have like some really bizarre ones like some of the new weapon types like you don't have the kasari gama or the switch glaive like a neo sorry no, are there st- no cestuses either no they're, they're they're you can you can you can go on arm and, and like um and punch people but no okay. punch people but but there's no like fist weapons unfortunately um but like they have like stuff like the bayonet in this game as a weapon style or a weapon type 
and like and it's cool because you can use it as like a, as a melee weapon and then like if you hold down a button you can fire at the end of like your combat a string or your attack string and that's cool do we but then know, they have like do we know if rise of the ronin is going to get dlc the reason i ask is that both neo games as well as wolong were pretty upfront and they actually have a pretty typical pattern now which is they have three DLC episodes, and then they release a complete edition. Have they? Is there anything like that for Rise of the Ronin yet? I know it's like a different structure of game, but I was wondering. I that, didn't I see anything in the said email. Yeah, they, so, they didn't say anything in the email about like DLC either. So, so I don't know. know. It's, yeah. Anyways, that's like I know for the other Team Ninja yeah. games, they all those DLCs usually add a handful of weapons. I was curious, but maybe that's just out out of scope for a game like this. Where in Neo and Wolong, it's pretty easy to add. Not easy. I, I shouldn't say easy, but it's kind of you can add more levels to tack onto the levels you have. Versus a game like this, you'd have to like create a new zone, which is different. So oh, maybe, here's, yeah. So yeah, I, I, yeah, I would imagine. I, I'm I, imagining what a yeah. hypothetical DLC would look like. So it yeah. wouldn't be the same sort of structure. But anyways, no, yeah. Continue. And then so. Uh, each of these styles has like a like the bayonet style has has like U S trading and like British trading, you know. So the the way that like you use the bayonet is like different between like if you're an American, if you're a Brit, you know. It's like I, I don't know if that's What's actually. Different? I don't I don't know if that's actually based off of real history, but I was like, okay, they have two different styles for bayonet based off of that. Um, but uh, each of these styles has like uh has like an attribute of like Jin, Chi, and Ten. And this is like the rock, paper, scissors style in between them. So as you're facing an opponent, like, you know, you obviously want to pick a style against them that's like, uh, that's advantageous towards them because you'll like get bonuses as you're fighting them um, uh, throughout it. Um, so, and then you have like the Shinobi style for like the pole arm and the katana that like is disadvantageous to all of the styles. But like if you counter spark against them, they'll like have more stagger, no regardless of. And that's the interesting thing about this game, where it doesn't have a light and heavy attack, necessarily. Like, all your attacks are done via the square button, but it's like it's like a basic attack streak, an advancing attack, or holding it down um, for a charge attack. Uh, and you have this, uh, your triangle is like, for the, almost like the parry, uh, like in Wolong, but it's called the counter spark. And the animation for this is different between styles. Sometimes it could be like, a parry and then counterattack animation, or sometimes it's like a parry stance, so it has low lower recovery frames if like you whiff it, for example. And this is all just functionally like, hey, if there's an incoming like fatal like enemy attack, like you can like perfectly counter spark it, so they do they have a lot of stagger on them. You can also uh, counter spark like normal enemy attacks. But like the one that'll matter the most in that is like the final enemy attack in a combo string to kind of get them off of balance, you know. So it does adopt that Wolong parry centric philosophy where like if you play well, yeah, like and, and understand and like memorize enemy move sets, you know, you'll have a way way better time against them uh, in that respect. Um, Makes sense. And then. Yeah, and then throughout combat, you can use like the grappling hook to like repel, like you know, get people out, out over to where you are, or repel, or or kind of or fly towards them with the grappling hook. Um, you, you get like other tools like like this flame pipe, like flamethrower. Um, you can coat your weapon in like different elements, which is not a magic system, but that's the closest you're gonna get. And it's it it it's all very fluid in action because you can switch weapon types and weapon styles during combat. In the same combat stri- uh, attack string, and it's very back and forth of like, hey, is it my turn to attack? Uh, that's kind of the basics of it. Yeah. So uh, reading your review, as well as seeing yeah. just in general other impressions of the game, not to not to imply that everyone has, is in agreement on everything, but it yeah. seems like a lot of people like, you know, the style of the game, you know, the era, the setting, and the combat being Team Ninja is solid. It's pretty good if not great, um, and people like those components, it just, it seems like just kind of the playing through the game, the structure of things is where it's kind of like, you know, something different, something new. Not everyone took to it great to it as well as, you know, they maybe would have hoped for an open world game, but seems like combat 
is as fun as it has been for Team Ninja games. So yeah, but it's it's just a very safe open world design, right? And especially and it's, it especially stings because like it they picked the unfortunate. It, 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 they did it like they they were like trying to sabotage like Dragon's Dogma two hundred eighty, but it's like it's like it's just like a very easy compare and contrast between like different two different big open world games, yeah. right? It's, um, is is now a good time to mention that Horizon Forbidden West came out on PC this week. Yeah. <laughs> they gotta stop doing this, man. <laughs> yeah, yes, it did. Um, this it was it was what put on guard by uh, Elden Ring how- for console, and now it's. Uh, Dragon's Dogma <laughs> 2 for the PC release. And it was how, Breath of the Wild the first time for the first game. Yeah. Yeah. How does this keep happening? <laughs> so, you know, the Horizon very good at like picking release. It's like, oh, there's gonna be something fire around that around that game's release. <laughs> so uh, yeah, I'm so very interested in this game. It. I'm so yeah. very interested in this game. I'll probably play it. I'm assuming it'll get a PC version. Yeah, um I so I I, I, I will probably Wolong play this. release day and date PC, right? Well, Wo Long was actually I think both Neo games had that like Sony partnership, so they came out on PlayStation yeah. first. Wo Long was pure Koei Tecmo, so it was yeah, no Sony. Okay. Uh, it uh, wasn't Wo Long like a, a Game Pass demo. Oh yeah, I think Pass that was actually anymore. more Xbox than anything else. It's yeah. on, it's on Game Pass, so, so it might have been like a Microsoft partnership. I don't I, I don't think we actually have this in our. Uh, do we have this in our? Oh yeah, we do. Uh, well, I'll just mention it now. Wo Long they announced that they surpassed five million players, which. Those Game Pass games always get a little tricky to like, is that good or not? Because, you know, that 5 million players will include people who are just Game Pass subscribers who downloaded it and played two seconds of it, right? So, um, but and, yeah. And, and speaking, of the, speaking of the 5 million number, like, I, I guess that there's a good time to mention, that, like, in one of the Koei Tecmo's, like, business slides, like, I forgot which report, but it's a recent, like, uh, like a business or financial report that, like, they're, they're, goals for what is presumably Rise of the Ronin because they said brand new IP, which is Rise of the Ronin. They're hoping this reaches like a lifetime sales of like 5 million. So it's not like going to be on PS5 alone, but eventually when it comes to other platforms, probably PC, they're hoping it reaches 5 million. Yeah, they uh, actually they actually had this in their slides from, I think, last November um, for their medium term plan stuff. Yeah, They mention, not by name, but they say they have a new IP in this medium term plan, which is a three year period that they're trying to get 5 million sales as their target. And it's like, it has to be rise of the Ronin. Like there's nothing else that fits that criteria. So yeah, yeah they're hoping for 5 million here. So yeah. So yeah, best of luck. You know. I think it'll happen. I think it'll happen. Yeah. I think, I think a lot, it'll be on a lot more people's radars when it comes to PC. Um, obviously right now, a lot of the, the mind share is Dragon's Dogma 2. You know, hopefully, hopefully we'll see some more interest in Rise of the Ronin when it gets uh, uh, a release somewhere else as well. I think I think it's a really interesting game. I just think it's also just a st- from a from an open world standpoint a very safe you can buy the numbers open world game. But in terms of like narrative and combat, obviously, um, pretty solid. And we have the reviews for both Dragon's Dogma Two. James and Rise of the Ronin from Josh up on the website at rpgsite.net. Going into the news section of our podcast, we actually have a decent number of announcements. Uh, we have one major DLC, two indie games, and then a, uh, I don't know what you would call this last one, another console project. Uh, we're going to go through these in order. The first one, this was just announced at the time of recording literally last night. And that is, is that we got a announcement trailer and a release date for the second of the two DLCs for Final Fantasy 16. This is Final Fantasy 16, The Rising Tide. It will launch on April 18th. And this is, of course, following on from the Echoes of the Fallen, which was a very small DLC that I think came out last was December. I played it in a single day, and I don't remember much about it. Um, But yeah, so Rising Tide, we got a new um, trailer for it. And they also talked more about um, the collaboration with 16 and 14. And I saw a little bit of goofiness about Yoshida saying, like, I'll have to ask the game director of 14 to talk about that or whatever. (laughs) Um, But yeah, so Rising Tide will be coming out at the time of recording in less than a month. And as expected and kind of predicted, it incorporates the um, icon Leviathan. And not a whole lot of concrete details here, but there's some teasing that it might 
there's there's I'll I'll put it this way. There's a stinger at the end of the Rising Tide trailer that is up for interpretation about a, what exactly you're seeing. Some people think it involves the ending. Some people think, oh, it's just framed in a certain way to make you think that. But yeah, and then of course because this involves a new um a new dominant and new icon, it shows uh. One thing that the Echoes of the Fallen DLC didn't do is it really didn't change up the combat much at all. We're here, of course, Clive will have access to Leviathan powers, and we see a, a new um, battle between Ifrit and Leviathan. There's a lot of stuff in the trailer. Um, yeah, one thing I will say that I really cool. appreciate that they did with the uh, new uh, combat style is that they actually changed up his ba- like Clive's base moveset, and it's like, oh, thank God. I wish that every icon had that in like yeah. 16. That would have on its own fixed like so many of my problems with that game's combat. Yeah. That, it was a game I noticed... that got old for me pretty fast. It was very exciting at the beginning. Then I remember when I got hard. I remember when I got uh the last one's Odin, right? Yeah. Yeah, I remember when I got Odin and it was like, wait a second, so there's an actually different move. Why doesn't every icon have this? <laughs> The oh, constraints, probably. But, uh... it, it, the, the big thing with me for this is like, man, so they released a new free update. Uh, our, our new free update will be available on April 18th to coincide with the Rising Tide release. There's some really big quality of life improvements in there that should have been in there at launch. Like, one of the bullet points is return to a quest giver immediately with a new quick complete function. That seemed big. Wow. Yeah, I wish I had that. Oh my god. Oh my god. That, that alone would, oh my god. Yeah, I, I saw about, that. I'm like, cause I, I remember watching. So I have, I still not have a, I have not played this game because I'm waiting for PC. Mm-hmm. But I remember watching uh-huh. Brian play, and he would like go from the quest area all the way out to wherever he had needed to do the quest, finish it, and then he had to run all the way back. Like, okay. It was just so so bad, especially with like the main hub and the, the latter half of the game, where it's like the way that's designed, like. The hub is like aesthetically interesting and all that, but moving around it was a fucking nightmare. Especially, especially with... when the quest giver was like all the way in the back of the second hub. It's like fucking kill me. I, I hate yeah. the one where the guardian is. Like it's oh, like yeah. this under. You know, I mean, they should have the just ship. created the world to be more like Dragon's Dogma too, and then you would be fine. Hey, how how about this bullet point for this free update? New custom controller type allows for fairly customizable button layouts. So like you couldn't assign you couldn't like assign buttons. Yeah, you, there, there was no free rebind uh, 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 for the button. I feel like for an action uh, RPG or like... an action game, usually that's pretty standard, or not, maybe maybe not standard, but I feel like good action games usually you can adjust what buttons do what. Hmm, oh, really so weird. It's not like, a good action game. This is really weird, right? Because at the, at the at the when this game came out, there was only like maybe two to three presets that they gave, and it's like okay, I guess some of these are like sensible. And then they added like another update that like added like maybe three or four more presets. And it's like why can't you just give me the option to like freely configure the buttons? It's like, oh, okay. This will be the t- the update that will uh, up the- that will add like finally button like free button config. It's like, okay, I guess. <laughs> oh, very weird. I'm just like, like some of this like is just crazy to me. That's like this, it, it, it took this long to finally get like some big quality of li- uh, quality of life updates for this single player game, huh? All right. Okay. Yeah, I feel like. I feel like the problem with this game, it's more like they're kind of made in schedule. They try to like undo the mistake of 15 and don't want to like do it behind schedule. But at the same time, it feels kind of bare bones in my opinion. I do not like the gearing system whatsoever in this game. It's like, oh, here's a new equipment. It's three numbers higher than the last one. Now the last one's completely irrelevant. And now you just go get the next one. It's... Like, like I had my fun with the game, you know. I've, I've said all I've, I've said about the game, you know, from the game's release, and you know, it is what it is. But it's just like, but some this update schedule for the game, it's just crazy for me. Like, that's fine. Like the, the the new content, fine. But like, some of this quality of some of these quality of life improvements that like should have been in there from the start. It was just like it's insane to me. What can you do? Well, maybe the launch of the beast PC version. Will I mean, the PC, yeah, the... they'll 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 be eating good. They have all these good things, and they probably have a completely different experience than we do. I, don't I know. mean, yeah, they'll have a stable frame rate, like a stable smooth frame rate, and they'll have all these quality of life enhancements from the start. They can freely button config from the from, in, in their play, first playthrough. God bless. They're they're lucky. You know? you know what they need? They need a, a skip icon battle for a new game plus. That's what they need. That'd be 
That'd be asking for too much. <laughs> That'd be awesome, though. So, I mean, I don't know. I don't, and I don't at, know at the do. event where they um, revealed this trailer and announced it, they mentioned that the, the location you're going to is where Jill is from, so she will have a role in the, in the DLC story. And I saw that shared on social media, but the trailer and the press release don't really focus on that. And I hope that it does. I really hope that it does, because that, that was a weakness of the original game yeah. storytelling. But they, it's something that they mentioned in the in the showcase for it, but it doesn't show up in the media, not very strongly. Uh, Jill has a few lines in the in the trailer, so I, I hope that she does get a role to play in the story, a major one. So we'll we'll see in less than a month whether or not or how to what extent. I've, that they I've seen that. some people already make a joke about how the new character in the DLC is a uh, white haired uh, girl, and it's like uh, considering. Uh, the writer of 16's uh, track record when it comes to that very, very uh, stereotype, it's like, yeah. Well, <laughs> uh, I, I mean, I guess some people will get their hair. I mean, Brian, you've planned to play this, right? Yeah, I played through the last one and I enjoyed it. And I'll play through this one just because I like to have a complete experience. Uh-huh. I would. The, the, the way that they it, phrase this, Sorry, I would ahead, be James. playing this, but. It, we're so close to the PC release. It's like I kind of, if I'm going to want to like pick it back up and do another playthrough or something, I'd, I'd rather just wait for the PC version at this point. But, but, I mean, like I feel like it'll be a a better experience this time around because of the quick complete thing for the quest alone. <laughs> to be honest, it'll what? save so much time. I was gonna say, what do you think it's gonna happen when the PC released? Is it gonna be like released like Final Fantasy VII, like Intergrade, where it has the DLC included for free? They better. Or, they I'd better. Have to, I'd have to imagine. I'd, ha- I'd have to. That'd be crazy if it doesn't. The, uh, You're forced to pay thirty dollars for extra on the PC version. That'd be weird. insane if it's not. Oh, God. I don't know. But, I mean, that's how. Yeah. The, uh, I just think you have like how yeah how remake Intergrade, but I'm just thinking of like other releases too, like when well, Neo, Final Fantasy the Neo games finally. Had yeah, the yeah, DLC would... bundled. In the they had the Royal edition, edition, right? Yeah. Well, Final Fantasy 15 is weird in that, like, not just DLC, but the all the all the weird, just weird, weird, weird updates that game got. Some of them, yeah, whatever. Oh yeah, but yeah, my <laughs> approach is I, I'm just gonna wait for the PC announcement, and if it comes with like the DLC, I'm just gonna buy the PC version <laughs> instead of paying thirty dollars to play the DLC now. It's just, I'll just take the gamble with the PC version. And I will play this and I will keep an open mind. And hopefully they, it just feels like, you know, we talk about like, what is a good DLC? And like, we've had, we've, I don't know, I don't know if we've focused on that topic specifically, but the games that seem to exemplify that the most, I guess we talked a little bit about it with Tales of Arise Beyond the Dawn and how that was kind of like, the most bare bones sort of DLC in terms of like, it didn't add any wriggles. It didn't change the format. It was just more of the same. And sometimes more of the same can be fine. Um, This one at least gives you the new icon, but it does, it it, it makes me see like, and the fact that it takes place like at the point of no return, it takes place basically um, when you unlock the last dungeon in the game. It's like, oh, you can take this place. Cause so it takes place before the ending, which makes sense for a number of reasons. But it, it, it kind of begs the question, like, could this have just been part of the game? What makes it DLC worthy? And I don't know if that's it's something that they will. And then on the other end of the spectrum, game. you have these like Xenoblade expansions, which are pretty much. Those, like... are, the, those are the best. Yeah. yeah. The best yeah those, those are like. Those are like. Those are those those practically like, yeah, like interstitial game. games. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah. Like, I mean, they have their own like. Uh, like Torna and like uh, Future Redeemed, like on like on their own or just. Straight up, like new games. They're like yeah. thirty something hour like RPGs. Mm-hmm. So we'll see with the rising tide in less than a month, and I'll play it and I'll report back. How about that? We have two uh, two indie game announcements this week. We do have an announcement for Tales of Iron Two: Whiskers of Winter. It's been announced for basically everything: PlayStation, Xbox, Switch, and PC. It will release at some point uh, this year. And this is the game that I, I've never played the original, but it's the game that has like the grim dark, like you play as like an anthropomorphic Dark Souls rat. Yeah, it's like <laughs> it's rats really, versus frogs. <laughs> I didn't realize it was versus frogs. Versus <laughs> frogs. But, uh, if I remember correctly, the frogs are evil. The rats are not. Just like 
Bucky O'Hare. Hey, I, I remember the first one. The narrator was the voice Doug actor Hoggle. of Geralt from Richard. Yeah, okay. Same guy. They they, they, guy. they advertised that again. Doug Cockle okay, is cool. back He's... as your narrator. Hell yeah. So. I remember that from the first one. And the first one, obviously, was received pretty darn well uh, on both Steam, and I think it came out on, eventually came out on Switch and the other consoles. So, And then the second one is slated for this year at some point. So for the, those that played the original and were fans, I think this is a, a fun little surprise. We also got another indie game uh, from developer Blue Banshee, which I've not heard of before, and this is called Maliki Poison of the Past. So um, it's the publisher behind Wakfu, which was like that French IP. Franime. That was Franime. Yes. Uh, which I remember I remember back in like 2010, 11. I'm trying to remember when that thing, when that first kind of became known, uh, uh, like a known IP. But uh, this looks like a, a fun... Um, game, but it's hard to know what type of game it is because the trailer is mostly them kind of flexing their animation muscles rather than showing gameplay. Uh, but it shows a little bit of gameplay. It looks kind of like a left to right turn based RPG with positioning. So kind of like I a, gather yeah. that if you live in France, you were, may already be familiar with this property, Maliki. I guess mm-hmm. it was like a comic or a webcomic or both that's existed for a while. And this game is actually being produced by like the creator of the comic but this is like the very first game of it like i am i have never heard of maliki before but apparently it is a french comic series that has that this is based on so it's not so it's it's an adaptation in a way um yeah it even says in the press release here uh 20 years of existence of the maliki comic book so not necessarily even new it seems like it's pretty established selling over 30 uh 300 000 copies uh so so yeah if you're french you probably have heard of this we i had not but well it's kind of it's, it's cool that the fact that you know hopefully fans of this ip will get a video game adaptation that's you know worthwhile it was announced for switch and pc though it was not announced with any specific release date so this is basically just an announcement saying like hey we got this project uh in the works, so for people to be excited about and keep their eye on. The last announcement here before we go into kind of the updates and uh, more kind of bit news is that the developer of Azure Lane is has announced Azure Promelia, which is a new creature companionship fantasy RPG. So thank Pokemon or Power World for PS5. Uh, PlayStation, not, sorry, PS5, PC, and mobile devices, iOS, and Android. And are these creatures the, um, ship girls? No, I don't what think so. Look, they just look like creatures. And this I watched looks this looks like a Genshin. This. this actually looks like a Genshin. Yeah, I was, I was, I was gonna say it looks it looks like a Hoyoverse project. It has that same like animation style as like Genshin or Star Rail. Uh, speaking as someone who has not played those, so maybe that's me judging a book by its cover. But one thing so, I thought was interesting on, about on. this trailer is, go ahead. I was going to say, hold on, this has a stagger system from Final Fantasy games now, too. <laughs> so you can Final Fantasy enemy. invent stagger? I don't know. Okay, I, like I, had I, I, I was just going to say, the trailer, as someone who is not has not played Azure Lane or Genshin, even though that's... as I, I also thought of Genshin when I, watched, when I saw this trailer, just because it visually looked very similar. The trailer doesn't have a huge focus on creatures. It has some at the start. But it's a 15 minute like, uh, gameplay demonstration uh, underneath. Oh, okay. Uh, I, didn't, I, didn't, I didn't You know what's it. the most dumbest part yeah. about this game is how China's outrage for the dumbest part. They discovered there's a male NPC and they're outraged. It's like, I thought this is a girl's game. That's it. Unforgivable. Uh, it's dead Unforgivable. Dead and the CEO <laughs> or the producer or somebody had to like make a statement. It's like, the gotcha will be just girls only, blah, blah, blah. Oh like they have to like apologize to this entire so community. Like, well, oh, you you God. need to create the you need to create the blank slate male NPC that you can insert yourself into, so you can collect all the Enjoy girls. It. This is like the Raymond problem with Girl Front. Oh, was it Girl Frontline Two? Where this one character, uh, they believe this is one character sleeping with this guy named Raymond, and they want this Raymond guy to be canceled, oh and God. they have to like completely rewrite the script that this Raymond guy does not exist. Uh, it's okay. Hilarious. <laughs> uh, that's and, crazy. Uh, it, it became a meme. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, 
So I mean, you know, going over like the 15 minute gameplay demonstration, it is like it definitely is like a fusion of like Genshin Impact with some Pal World in it. Um, you know, it, it's it's very like that that type of Genshin. Hey, the the very flashy combat. You switch between characters, but now you can they all you can also summon your your pets along with them in the middle of combat. It's very grassy fields, open world, uh, exploration. You know, it's. I don't know. We've, we've kind of almost all seen this before in some way, shape, or form because of Genshin, and there's been a lot of other projects that have come out since Genshin that are trying to be like Genshin, especially with the way they present their UI and interface and so forth. Um, I, mean, I guess I'm uh, sure. I mean, give it your best shot. You know, people want to be the next Genshin because it makes so much fucking money. So. Um, good luck, you know. Well, I, yeah, I don't have more competitors. I really don't like the Genshin or the Hoyoverse of rolling system. It's one of the worst, in my opinion. Everyone's just copying it and doesn't show any sign of improving it or making it better. I mean, if it makes money, then why, 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 imp- why improve it when, when you're well, making that's money? I hope there's more competition, <laughs> you know? If there's more competition, then surely they'll make it yeah. better, right? Yeah, like, yes. So. I mean, um... I don't think, yeah, they haven't really set a release date, but they just said, okay, it's coming uh, soon. Pre-registration is now available, oh. so you can, if you're excited and interested, you can sign up now. Yeah. At their website. Sure, I guess. I have my load of playing Genshin. I don't need another one. I, I think the only one that's, like, maybe sort of interesting is that Project Mugen game. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I Josh kinda, needs I the anime like... Spider-Man. Yeah, no, we funny. need the anime Warframe. Oh yeah, they're doing the they 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 they, they had signups for that too. What's it called? The I, ooh, I already I forgot. Covered it. I don't remember. Uh, do do at nights of oh, this yeah. rose, yeah, or something. I don't know. Okay. Right, sure. I'll, I'll just say yes to any potential game title. Oh, it is do at night of this. Okay, right. Yeah. Got it. This next piece of news, I know. Uh, Adam and Josh and potentially others have been were very interested to see because it's out of nowhere. And that is that Alpha Protocol has been re-released on PC on GOG with a modernized port after being delisted about five years ago and has been unavailable to purchase ever since. So Adam, you kind of got the details for this one. Uh, what is Alpha Protocol and why why should I care that it, uh, it has a PC port again? Well, according to Kotaku, it's a spy RPG from the developers of Fallout New Vegas. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh. Yeah, anyways, that, that's, that's a little bit of a pet peeve of mine. But anyways, um, where anything Obsidian does has to be related to Fallout somehow. But anyways, um, yeah. uh, so Alpha Protocol is... How, where do I start with this? I think this is a really cool news that came out of nowhere. Both conceptually... And just part of like this game itself. So Alpha Protocol is an spy RPG released in 2010 from Obsidian Entertainment. Uh, you know they they made Pentiment, they made Outer Worlds, they made Nice Little Republic, Fallout New Vegas, and Nice yes, Little Republic too. <laughs> uh, and it's published by Sega. Now, uh, so this game. It was delisted about five years ago. It, it came out on PlayStation 3. And it was one of those PlayStation 3 releases that never had a digital release, because if you remember, those didn't have to, at least in the start of that console's life, it, right. on Xbox 360 and on PC. Um, the PC version, I want to say, it was one of those in the Games for Windows Live era <laughs> of PC ports. So it's not a great. P- it wasn't a great PC port. And this game was never re-released. It was never remastered. Didn't ever come out on any other console like past that era. And eventually, it was just no longer able to be purchased. Uh, they never said this explicitly, but the reason why it was delisted was there is a boss fight in the game that plays uh, licensed music. It's turn up the radio from Autograph. And... Uh, they even there was a video that came out with when Gog announced this re-release, where some of the Sega producers at the time were actually like kind of brought up. Apparently, when this game was being developed, like, hey, you know, if you have this licensed music, it's going to expire eventually, right? And they admittedly basically said at the time they just didn't really even 
think of that. Like they they kind of knew it was going to be expired, but or it was going to expire, but they didn't like really put any deeper thought into it. They're like, well, we'll just license it and figure it out later. And it turns out that it was delisted. And basically, a mix between uh, CD Projekt, who runs GOG, uh, Sega and Obsidian, they went through the process, legal process, which they said took them about a year and a half to get this game re-released on GOG. And uh, they put out a video with a YouTuber, YouTuber whose name I forget. I'm sorry. Grand you probably know him. I, I don't. Yeah, I'm not familiar yeah, with this guy. I'm sorry. Me, me um, neither. But 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 let, let, just to be clear, like but for this documentary, it's one. It's a very very good documentary yes. uh, uh, detailing the the release of the re-release of the Sungog. And two, even, they even mentioned in the in the documentary that a year and a half to like get this process, like the stars aligning perfectly. Yeah, that was very very lucky because it could take many many years uh, for this to for any of these like re-releases and, of older games to kind of happen. And I believe the title of this documentary, or at least the concept behind it, is Making a Game Last Forever. They are intentionally, this project that God will do sometimes, is they are doing this in the sake of preservation. Like, we want this game to be available. We want it to be something you can buy. And even this YouTuber who has done some videos on this game was like, is Alpha Protocol an amazing game? Maybe not. Maybe we'll talk about this in a bit, but it is a very cool game. It's, it has some interesting components that are, in a way, unmatched. But in the last five years, you couldn't buy it, and there's going to be lost to time. Um, so the fact that now you can buy it, and it should be there forever, ideally, uh, you know, whatever circumstances, but that was kind of the goal of this whole project, was to bring back a game to make it available. And then, kind of talking more about the game itself, Alpha Protocol does have some uh, really cool reactivity and dialogue systems that no other game has really emulated. And I just think this is really cool. I bought it. I actually ended up buying this PC port. I don't know when I'll, if I'll play it or when I'll play it, but like I wanted to support it. Um, yeah, absolutely. So, and uh, part of this uh, documentary from Racevic, Racevic. Uh, the YouTuber, the again, the title of that is Making a Game Last Forever, is there was two lines or two kind of like theses in the in the YouTube video. And it's it's like 18 minutes. It's a good watch. You should you should watch it. Hmm. Um, there was two lines that I thought like really conceptualized just kind of like what this means. It's not just, oh, you can play Alpha Protocol again, even though it is that. But like Alpha Protocol was the perfect game to be forgotten because it wasn't received well. It didn't sell well. Um, it never be. It never had any sort of like influencer or person like bring it back into public consciousness. It, was ne it never had a spiritual successor or follow up. Obsidian doesn't have the rights to the game anymore. Sega has no interest in continuing the IP. It could have just been forgotten. But who do you want to have control over whether or not you can choose to play it? Like the fact that reviewers didn't like it. The fact that no storefront can host it. The fact that there is like digital rights that prevent you from owning it. Like that, those really shouldn't be barriers to entry, regardless of the quality of the game. So, and it's, it's so it's, it was a really fun watch. And um, I don't think I've ever, Adam, this is going to sound really sil silly that I can't remember this, but I don't think I've ever actually played this game. But I've watched you and I've watched our, uh, our, our other brother Daniel play this game, I think a handful, like probably like six times in total. Like, I feel like I've played this game because I've seen other people play it so many times because it is a fun game to watch i think because it has so much reactivity in terms of how the story unfolds but i don't think i've ever actually played it myself so maybe I'll so have i have a couple okay. of things to say first of all we've talked about alpha protocol before on this podcast within the last year somehow we somehow brought it up have i don't we? know how. <laughs> okay. yes we have we have a couple of titles of our podcast of somehow somehow we're alpha protocol themed how did that happen i don't know um <laughs> but um uh this how do I put this? So the dialogue system in the game, it's not perfect, but you basically are making like decisions based on like a tonality in the moment, like while the other character is speaking, like how how are you gonna respond to this? And while it doesn't always work out perfectly, this the YouTuber Racevic actually puts it pretty well in that it helps you to avoid like Bioware face where you basically, in a lot of Western RPGs, especially around that era, dialogue is sort of like an interrogation or an interview where your character is just like, what do you think about this? What do you think about this? 
what do you think about this? And then the, your NPC would like talk back like with answers. And that was like dialogue. And really, that's not very natural where you'd have like this one sided conversation where your player character just asks a bunch of questions and the NPC answers them. And like a lot of Western RPGs do that just kind of as nature of how a game works. But Alpha Protocol kind of avoids that and helps dialogue flow much more naturally because you're sort of picking like tonalities as the dialogue is going. And no other game has really tried or tried to improve on it or tried to implement something similar to that in terms of in this framework of a Western RPG. Um, and also, um, one I saw probably the most, I, I, there is a, a lot of response on Twitter about this game. They're, they're kind of all in the same vein, but probably one of my favorite responses that I saw on Twitter for this was something along the lines of, I played Alpha Protocol for an hour, hated it, and continued to play through it three more times. Um, <laughs> the reason why that's interesting and that makes sense if you played it is that this game is so reactive. And like Brian said, you probably watched me and our other brother play this so many times is that like you kind of want to see like, what happens if you do it in this order? What happens if you do this to this character? Because the game is structured where you kind of can go to like three different locations in any order. And each in each of those three locations, you meet, I don't know, three or four characters that you can interact with in lots of different ways. And depending on the order in which you do these locations and depending on what you say and do with the characters in each location, it changes the events of the other two locations that you haven't been to yet. So it's it's extremely reactive. So the reason why I played it so many times and this random Twitter response talks about playing through it three times is because it's that sort of game where it's so different that there's yeah. very different endings. There's there's The endings are very, very different depending on, on what you do and who you talk to and whatnot. Um, I, th I thought you were going to pull a different Twitter quote when you said one of the responses. Oh, there was, a, there was another I... smaller Twitter quote calling it peak mid is back. Yeah, peak, peak mid. mid. <laughs> uh, but yeah, uh, long story short, I really do appreciate Alpha Protocol for what it is. I The fact that it is so novel and somehow is still so novel, that I, 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 I value that more than... Yeah, it's a little janky. The RPG systems are a little weird, uh, but I think that the the novelty of some of its mechanics and re reactivity trumps everything else, and it's the reason to play this game. And I probably will play through it again at some point because it's not that long. Um, so yeah, yeah it's really cool. like yeah, this is if I were to review this, it it, it seems like that sort of game where like if you were to review it, it like uh, maybe you know six, seven. Who cares about the number? I love this game. This sort of thing. yeah, peak mid. It, it's one of those things that, like, like thinking about it, like, if I ever to review this game, like, it'd be, I'd be, like, so divided on it, because I'd, I'd have to, like, I'd, I'd think about the the old GameSpot scale, where they had, like, very, like, almost rigid objective scores of, like, of, like, graphics, this number, sound, this number, gameplay, this number, and then, like, the reader's sway of, like, the overall thing. Like, it'd be, like, probably low numbers for like a lot of the those factors of reader sway is like 20 you know <laughs> you, do you know what the uh do you know what the rpg site review of this game is uh, it doesn't seven. exist no one ever did it oh uh, yeah okay yeah. <laughs> makes sense <laughs> well here's our chance yeah here's there our chance give, give it the give it the 10 it deserves adam i will do that <laughs> that'd be a six year late to review this this game this game would be like a thirteen year late years. or whatever. So oh, no. years. Nah. <laughs> <laughs> I it just got delisted, so I find it's more recent. Kind of no, thing. it's from two thousand ten. No. So, so yeah, it's, uh, Alpha Protocol, yeah, one hell of a game. That's like it, it. In some ways, it makes sense why it's so unmatched in terms of like in the creation of this game. Even its developers were like, "Should we do this on paper? No, but we'll do it anyway." <laughs> Uh, of like how of like all these differences is like how they react and react to each other on like things that are happening in the moment and things that will happen later. Like there's so many permutations that like on paper it's insanity to do this, but they did it anyway. Um, I don't know if this is like how I don't I don't know exactly how this how this uh, game or how this re-release came about. But I want to say that Patrick Mills at CD Projekt was probably a huge reason why. Patrick Mills, if you don't follow him, he's pretty cool. 
Uh, he used to work at Obsidian, and he worked on Alpha Protocol. He then he's been he's moved around a few a few places, and he's at CD Projekt now. And CD Projekt makes The Witcher, makes Cyberpunk. They also do GOG, and he was like the connective tissue in that. Like, hey, I worked on Alpha Protocol. I love this game. I appreciate this game. And now I'm at CD Projekt, which I'm I'm literally in the same offices that GOG is in. Maybe I can pull some part pieces together here and get something to work. Uh, I don't know, you know, m more about behind the behind the th behind the scenes than that. But like, I appreciate Patrick. Like, even if he's just like being a vocal supporter of this, sometimes it just takes one person. And even this this uh this uh documentary that we've been referencing kind of mentions this too. Sometimes it just like a couple of phone calls can really get things moving. Not to say that it's easy, but like if a few phone calls weren't made, this might have never happened. You know, so. Mm -hmm. I yeah, that's something that, that Rachevik talks about on his uh, on his documentary right. too, and yeah, and I got I had the chance to interview Patrick about Cyberpunk back in I think E three twenty seventeen, like <laughs> like that was only three years ago, right? No, <laughs> it was seven years ago. Um, but yeah, he's a great follow, great guy, and watching this, this seems definitely like a passion project, like something that like not a cash grab, not publisher driven, just something that they really wanted to do with some genuine you know feel behind it. Uh, we did have a few more uh, other games that had updates this week before we go into like the sales and the date rundown. Uh, the the newest Chrono RPG, MMORPG Chrono Odyssey. <laughs> that was sillier than I intended. Yeah, yeah, this is the Anyways, new Chrono, Chrono Project. Odyssey. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we got a new trailer uh, during GDC. Basically, when they announced this game back in, what was it? Last May. Um, sure. This is a, an RPG by Chrono Studio. Uh, published by Kakao Games. Uh, it was, it's basically been a, they've been using it kind of to show off Unreal Engine 5. Like here's an MMO in Unreal Engine 5. That's kind of like the the posture that they've been taking to um, to sell this. But, and then during GDC, they show this another one, they're called 2024 State of Unreal for Chrono Odyssey, which still doesn't have a, um, like a listed release date, though I guess they have announced it for consoles. So it'll be a both uh, PC and consoles at some point. Uh, so the new trailer is about 90 seconds of flexing off the engine. Shows some things that are kind of like suggestive of gameplay, but not really. It's mostly just in-engine fun, I suppose. Yeah, very, mostly this uh, very... this trailer is mostly just announcing the new publisher and that the Unreal Engine 5 showcase, more or less. I mean, it is yep. a game developers conference. Um one yeah, thing that's that a little sense. bit Not odd really, yeah. about this announcement, um, when it was announced last year, the publisher and developer behind the game was NPixel, which I had never heard of, but is a Korean studio. I guess they've made some mobile stuff, some other online stuff or whatnot. And actually, this announcement, I basically said, like, because uh, Chrono Studio is a studio at NPixel, as far as I understand. They actually reached out to me and basically said, please remove all... Uh, mention of the name N Pixel, not because it's inaccurate, just oh, because really? they don't want you to know. I guess. Oh, um, well, <laughs> like it's Chrono strange. Studio. The, the way it was described to me, it's sort of like NeoWiz and Round Eight. Where Round Eight, the developer of Liza P, is a NeoWiz studio, but they're called Round Eight Studio. So, like, you could say it's developed by Round Eight, but it's a NeoWiz studio. So, like, you could say it's developed by NeoWiz, and you're still accurate. As far as I understand, NPixel and Chrono Studio are basically the same, but they're like, you, we don't call it NPixel. I don't know why. But there was also some odd, like, it's sure. not in our wheelhouse, but there was also some similar discussion with like the Tomb Raider remasters. Like by the book, they're developed by. I thought it was Aspire. Aspire. But I guess it was actually Saber Interactive. They're all under Embrace. Oh, right? Aspire. Um, well, they were. They, they, not anymore. They were, right. <laughs> Aspire is uh was is a what was a subsidiary of Saber. Now they're not. Uh, not any. But like but my understanding is that Saber did the port but Saber is a Russian studio but they wanted to credit it to an American studio cuz Aspire is based in Texas. Like it's always weird just like who actually worked on this? <laughs> like it's hard to try to suss it out. They put I also do think it's it very then... weird that um I also think it's very weird that Embracer's press release for when they divested Saber Interactive the way they framed it was like, we are getting out of Russia. 
like, okay. Uh, okay. <laughs> it's like, we don't want anything to do with Russia, so we are divesting Saber. That's the way they framed it. It was kind of strange. When really they're just trying Very to you honest, know, liquidate a bit. I don't, I don't, I guess like, not to say there's no truth in that. Just that's the way they highlighted it. It was kind of weird. But yeah. You got to be public about it. Uh, here's an update that actually involves the changing of a release date. And we had a, we have a, we have two of these actually in the podcast right now uh, this week. Uh, this is the recently announced Shin Megami Tensei Five Vengeance has had its release date moved up one week from June twenty first to June fourteenth. Elden Ring DLC bully. Elden Ring DLC victim number one. Yep. This this will be brought up again later. <laughs> they also released a. Uh, yeah, you're gonna, you're gonna they also it. released a media another media pack. Um, I would say like eighty percent of this media pack for Shin Megami Tensei Five Vengeance is just like reintroducing the characters again um, that were in the original version of the game. So that part specifically isn't very interesting. It also reintrodu- it also introduces um, the other three Kaditsu Kwaditsu. I don't know how you pronounce that. The, there's like the four female new demons that are, are added. They they introduced Lilith in the last set. Now they introduced the other three, which is Nama, Isis, Zenuman, Zen, Zenunim, and Agrat Bat Malat. I probably mispronounced a bunch of those, but they introduced those three three new demons. You're trying your best. Yes, I'm trying my best. I actually don't know what like the etymology of these demons are, like where they're from exactly. Uh, but anyways. I think it's, I want to say like Mesopotamian, but anyways, uh, probably the most interesting thing is that they, you could kind of see that this could be the case from the original trailer, but they confirmed outright that the human characters, so that is Tao, Yuzuru, and Ichiro, our good good guy Ichiro Dezai, will join your party at times as guest characters and participate in battle. Which we've seen that a handful of times before with like SMT4 and 4 Apocalypse. In fact, it was a pretty crucial part of Four Apocalypse. But um, there's actually even like a screenshot of Tao doing media. We saw some clips in the earlier trailer of some of them doing some stuff in battle. So that's new. So I didn't do that in the original version. So it remains to be seen how exactly that works or how do they tag along for a significant portion of time or just in certain sections. I'm not sure. Uh, but that's something that's new is they join as guest characters now. And I guess the last thing is that there's now an, there's now a consecutive encounter mechanic. I don't think this was in the original, but I know other SMT games have had similar things where if you battle multiple battles in a row, your rewards go up. You've seen it before. But yeah, that's going coming out a week earlier. So yeah. so when yeah, Matt Gasser. When, so when if during the summer games fest stuff, uh, we might have a review code for this, maybe. So, and we have like some so interestingly enough, like some returning demons because of soul hackers too. Oh yeah, at least we, they got some demon assets from there and put it in here as well, like Mad Gazer. Yeah, in the in the first in the first packet that came out when they announced the game, we saw that they brought it back Turbo Granny, and now oh, we yeah. see they have Mad Gazer, which is I, another I, soul the, hackers the, demon. The new. Uh, Senri, like was Senri in Soul Hackers too? I can't. I can't Senri, remember. Senri, I think so. Uh, unfortunately, I'm at the point where I played so many SMT games, I kind of forget. Yeah. Like, what version? <laughs> what were they in? Was that a, was that just a Persona Five demon? Or are they? I don't remember. But yeah, I, exactly. I don't remember. And then there's some like interesting like shots shots in here, like showing like some of the new abilities that involve multiple demons, like oh, yeah. the angel. You have the angels. Rock. You have the the four kings. Four of the kings. Yeah. yeah. Um, there's one with cats. You have uh, Ketchi, Nekomata, and the night one whose name I forget. Um, That's fun. They're like doing a cat attack called Feline Fury. <laughs> this might be a dumb thing to fixate on, but when they announced this, they said that it's going to come with like they're going to package in the old DLC but come out with new DLC. Yep. Yes. We all love Atlas DLC. <laughs> and we, yeah. And have they detailed any of that or not? Really? Uh, they have. The, mm-hmm. One of them was like the Dagda from uh, SMT4 Apocalypse, and the other is like a brand new demon. Uh, let's see. So oh, the, 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 the DLCs that are included. So the original game, Brian, you played it, right? It had like yeah. Uh, there was a couple of DLCs. Like there was one with. Well, I didn't. I, oh, 
I played Shin Megami Tensei Five, but I did not play any of the DLCs. Yeah, there I was like one with Cleopatra. There was one with Artemis. There was then the big one with Demi Fiend. Uh, so those there's four of them. Those four DLCs are included. So those were paid DLC before, but now they're included. However, Along there's with the the cheat DLC, right? No, I think the cheat DLC. I don't think that is included. I think hmm. that is still separate. It's it's there. It exists. Oh yeah, so I'm re- I'm reading the old press release now. So the new DLC, in terms of like content, there's one with Dagda and there's one with uh, Konohana Sakia. But then it even says, in addition, DLC that makes it easier to gain experience and in-game currency will be released at the same time. And the way that it's formatted, it sounds like that is included as like that will be paid. Which a lot of Atlas games have that cheat DLC now. We were talking about microtransactions earlier. Atlas is honestly mm-hmm. a pretty bad. Uh, contender for this sort of stuff and that they always have this sort of cheap junk DLC where it's like just buy this and you can do like this extra battle to get mo- to get like stupid amounts of money or whatever. There we go. There, there, there's a ranking listicle uh, feature on the table right there with uh, the ranking the companies on the worst DLC. Oh, Atlas taxes. and Sega is probably top. We've <laughs> talked before of Yakuza and SMD5 mm. and Persona. If you bought the if you bought the one hundred dollar Persona three version, you still don't get access to the expansion pass, which is thirty five more dollars. <laughs> so, yeah, the, yeah, they're, and pretty, that they're expansion pretty. Pass is two things of cosmetics and yeah, then, two things that don't really matter and one thing and, and, and then PS two content. Yeah, uh, yeah. They're, they're pretty hard to top. It's, Good job, pretty... Atlas. You're at the top of our list. <laughs> so, Atlas positions one, two, three, four, and. <laughs> And then we also have another update, one of several that we seem to have these weeklies for uh, the upcoming Sandland RPG that's coming out in late late April. This one is about the forest region, which is actually kind of fun because it's a a slightly different environment compared to what was has been showcased in most. Oh, this is interesting. We we talked briefly Mm -hmm. about this when uh, Akira Toriyama passed away. Mm -hmm. In terms of like, I didn't know about this, and I learned about this. a little bit back then, but also do it, digging more into it. The new adaptations of Sandland, both in this game and in the the movie that's been split up into anime episodes as well, that released, I've, I believe, sometime uh, this week um, on Disney Plus. Uh, so both uh, this game and that and that adaptation, they actually include uh, continue the story from where the original manga left off. And that I believe this new story was like the I don't know if, if Akira Toriyama actually wrote it directly or like they they took what Akira Toriyama like had notes on it and like decided to like you know expand on it and like actually make it into like you know a real you know thing because it was just like a one shot before right yeah yeah so but it, but it was some but the original like bones of it were from Toriyama himself I don't know if he like directly like wrote it himself for the new for, mm-hmm. for the game or, or the new uh film app, anime whatever but uh, that's where the continuation of sandland is is like like the the, the quasi sequel i guess but now it's been like officially integrated I into think this I, new last week i actually saw some outlets being like reviewing sandland like here's our sandland review it's decent it's pretty good and whatnot and i was like wait a minute we're already getting reviews for that like oh no wait that's the anime thing, not the game thing. Yeah, because that came out yeah. just not too long, like this week, right? So right. yeah, so so that so like a, so it's not actually like like a separate like Sandland two that they that I believe yeah. he was working on. It's like, this is actually the continuation. Yeah, the new adaptations. Anyways, I so when I was writing this news bit, I was tempted to name it like Sandland introduces Forest Land. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah. But yeah, they introduced the, the, the forest land. If you look at the new trailer for this, it introduces a lot of like characters in this forest land. There's like I guess like right. there's like four like generals that you meet that are like I guess all I don't know if they're all antagonists, but that you have to deal with. It also the press release doesn't actually go a lot into this, but they, they there's like a new character that tags along with uh Beezlebub or Bezelbub or how you pronounce his name, um, who's like kind of like a a Luca type, like Trinket fix it mechanic girl. So I need to lot, I, I need to reread figures. the original manga because I, I want to reread the original manga, which won't take too long. 
they actually mm-hmm. want to like see like the new series because uh, because I, I signed up to review this and I kind of want to do my due diligence on research <laughs> actually on this to get it yep. right. Um, so that's my homework for this game. Number two, uh, they did release a demo for this game out of nowhere th- this week. Oh yeah, uh, it was like kind of a shadow drop on uh, on consoles and PC. I downloaded it on PC. I did play it. Uh, hopefully, this is not the case with the full PC release, but they did not um, case shaders uh, on this. So there's a lot of stuttering on this PC uh, port of this game. Where like if you're like doing something new or seeing something new for the first time, there is stutter. So like like it's a very sandbox type of demo where like it's a it's a small piece of the open world and you have like three vehicles you can mess around with and there's just, like a random allotment of like enemies along that like small piece of land. So you can like test out like how these vehicles um operate well and like it kinda uh, equip them with like different equipment and so forth. So it's a very sad box type of demo. It's just like whenever you see something new for the first time, whether it's like a new vehicle you're summoning or a new piece of equipment, or like you're just doing something new for the first time, it'll stutter. So, and then it'll smooth out after like maybe like 20 minutes or so after you've like seen everything for the first time, and there's no stuttering. But I'm hoping for the full release on PC that they just, you know, they shader compile first uh, from the game. Yeah, game. yeah, I'll be honest. I like had downloaded the the demo, but because I was in the middle of like Dragon's Dogma 2 when the demo dropped, uh, I heard the reports about the uh, shader compilation stutter. So I was like, okay, I'm going to yeah. delete that demo. I'm not even going to try it. Yeah. I, I was like, I didn't know about that until like I loaded up. I played it for like a half an hour just to mess around. But I'm like, yep, I. Ooh, hopefully th- this is not the final state of the PC release. <laughs> that's That's not good. That's not good at all. It's also worth mentioning that this demo doesn't like it seems like from what I heard it's a very small demo that's like a very small yeah. bit of the game just to kind of like play around in it a little bit. Yeah. And there's no yeah. there's no like save data transfer but you do get a couple extra items if you do it. Hmm. That's about it. But I was looking at the the Steam forums the first Steam uh title or Steam forum title I saw was in caps stutterland. I'm like, "Yep. <laughs> Nailed it in the first one." <laughs> And I, then, would I, imagine, guess, I would demo, imagine that the uh, oh, PC sorry. port is probably... It's the same developer, same publisher as the One Piece game. So... Oh, this is Ilka? Yep, I'm pretty I, sure. Yeah, I believe huh. so. Yeah. I, I don't know how that, that uh, the state of that... Um... I mean, I know it's like a different type of game. Like, not turn-based. Yeah. It's like, but, you know, Wasteland but, but, feels... But do, stuff, they, like... but do they shader compile on the, for that, for One Piece? I don't know. <laughs> Speaking of demos, they did also we did also get a demo for a game that already released this week. That is Front Mission Two Remake. So this came out late last year. We had the discussion about its localization. Uh, one of those post-release demos that they put up on the eShop because it's Switch exclusive. So figured I'd mention that we now have a demo for that game. I mean, I, I think figured. even even if it's post-launch, I think the publishers going out of their demos way to like, create a demo after the fact. I'm for it. Why not? You know, I mean, yeah, I'm always going to be for for hey, let let players try out their their game before they buy it. Um, so even if it comes after the fact, at least it's appreciated. But I'm always going to be for hey, try to fucking make a demo for your game and make let people make an informed decision for themselves and at least see if they can if they're like if for PCs for example if their like system can even run it to give them like the opportunity to do that. Obviously, this for the Switch. Obviously, every Switch can run it, but you know. Having play more playable demos is always a net positive, in my opinion. Before we go into dates, uh, we talked, we mentioned early that earlier that Will Long Fallen Dynasty hit five million players, right? During yeah. the Rise of the Ronin discussion, yeah. And we have a similar sort of thing. We also brought up this game kind of earlier when talking about publishers um, in Korea. Lies of P from Neo is has reached 7 million players. So that's two announcements this week, Wolong Long reaching 5 million players and Lies of P reaching 7 million players, where, again, they go with the number of players because of the Game Pass angle in terms of how many of those are digital sales, how many of those are physical sales, how many of those are um, subscription players. We don't know. It's a little bit obfuscated. So uh, still, 7 million people playing your game has got to be, for a new IP, 
from a kind of a, a, a unproven studio around eight, as Adam mentioned. Obviously, it seems like a pretty big win for those guys, especially in a genre that's pretty damn crowded. Yeah. Considered. I mean, like, I haven't played Liza P yet, but pretty much everyone I know that has has been like, yeah, this is uh, on par with uh, From Software, which is uh, pretty impressive for essentially the highest praise you can yeah. bestow yeah, from the, from the same developers as Bless Unleashed. Yep. <laughs> That's the Kotaku headline right there. <laughs> All right, uh, some updates. We talked about the Sandland demo uh, is now available. Front Mission Remake, Front Mission 2 Remake demo is now available. Uh, registration is open for the new Azure um, Promalia project. We also do have registration open for the next Zenless Zone Zero closed beta test from Hoyoverse. So there was a, there was a previous beta test right around the turn of the calendar, I think, late December, early January. Uh, we don't, as far as I can tell, we don't know the date of the next closed beta test, but they are taking registration um, on their website right now. This is a re- there's a really interesting one to follow because this will be their third closed beta test, which is something you don't really see out of like uh, these these types of projects having this many closed beta tests. Um, because in the second one, like even the the the, the reception to the second closed beta test of this game uh, wasn't looking so good. So they're hoping. That, that it's going to be in a much better state now after they, they're going to you know change some things about it that people didn't like for the second close beta test. But right now, this game seems like you know a lot a lot of people from hands on on it just aren't feeling it. Um, so there, it, it's kind of interesting to see. It's like oh, they're trying to do this again. Like I, I in my mind, I'm just like, what happens then if like if they don't get it by this third close beta test and the reception to it is still not like as positive as they want it to be. What do they do then? <laughs> Go for a fourth beta test. Yeah, just keep up close. That's the. <laughs> just keep up close. But you know what they say: "Per times a charm." Okay, right? Is that mm-hmm. how it goes? Is that... Yeah, I mean that—that that oh. is a saying. Yeah. Oh, so. I don't know. I, I I have zero interest in this game to be honest with you. But I think if they change the auto system, maybe it might gain like what the Western audience was complaining about. So you're maybe saying not. you have a so zero system? interest. You know, uh, it's easy to, see to me. I'm falling asleep talking about it. <laughs> Damn. So, but I mean, yeah, they showed some more new characters, but you know, I it's always interesting. Uh, it's always interesting when I hear closed beta test feedback of this game. It's like it's largely not positive. It's very mixed or negative, which is interesting. And it's it's coming from people who usually are fans of either or Genshin or Honkai Star Rail. Yeah, because you know those are the global products from. Bioverse and like, oh, I'm interested in their Zenless Zone Zero urban fantasy RPG turn based thing. And then they still come away saying, eh, I'll stick with what I'm currently playing. Yeah. I don't know what kind of audience this attracts. Like, you probably end up like cannibal uh, your own audience with like Honkai Impact for releasing this game, in my opinion. I mean, so that, I that's, kind of, kind of, that's kind of the, the that, that's in the end, the, 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 I imagine it doesn't really matter for Horioverse as long as they're making money, right? So, like, yeah, but you know, in my opinion, it's like, if I was the company, I would probably just put more resources in making that one game being better. That's for me. But, I mean, no. that, that, but what the, what does the money chart say? Will will we make more money doing this or this? Well, I hope it failed then. <laughs> well, we're never well, getting speaking of, Well, speaking of Hoyoverse, we'll stay on topic, and uh, this might be something of more interest to Chow. Honkai Star Rail, we talked a couple weeks ago, or a couple months ago, about its major 2.0 update. And on March 27th, I'm just going to read the headline. Version 2.1 adds Asheron, Aventurine, and Gallagher. A Carrion, okay. Uh, a Carrion. Uh, but she's, her name is Yomi in, in the Japanese and Chinese version. Like, Yomi as in, like, the oh. yellow river, as, like, as in, like, hell <laughs> in, like, okay. Oriental Fort Floor. <laughs> If you well, get what I'm saying, yeah. What is this, uh, yeah. Uh, is, does, does this uh, update interest you? Like, the, does there, are there like threads of this? That's like, oh, okay, that makes sense that they're going in this direction. Well, I, it's like her character is like, extremely cool looking. Like, have you ever seen her ultimate? I think that's like the coolest ultimate ever made in the game. The only problem is I don't like this character's kit at all whatsoever. So I'm just kind of rolling this character for her aesthetics, basically. Um, so, which so you're just you're just, you're just rolling for a character that you're not going to use. 
Yeah, basically, because I, I despise her kit. It, it basically, you're forced to use Nihility type characters. Remember how I said I hate Nihility characters because mm -hmm. they're mostly dot users? And she is kind of like from that same branch of path, but she's not a dot user. She's like a pure DPS, but in the dot class. So none of like the, you know, the light cones, like basically the weapons of Hankai Star Rail, uh, she can't use like the hunt light cones because she's not a warrior. She's a Nihility user. So you're kind of forced to like roll on her light cone to make her useful, which is kind of like scummy in a way because she's like a complete different path, right? Mm -hmm. And then the other thing is like, uh, was it her ultimate? Does it not work like the other characters? Uh, like most characters, they have an energy bar, right? And if you fill the energy bar, you use the ultimate, right? Uh, hers ultimate, it goes like this. You basically have to bring in, like, Nihility characters, and they get, like, extra charges for how many Nihility characters you bring. So if she's all by herself, she's never going to get her ultimate active because the charge will take forever to fill up. So you have to bring, like, a whole team of Nihility users you want to, like, activate her ultimate. And so I, I do not like her kit at all. Apparently they changed her kit, like, several times according to leaks because people weren't satisfied with how her kit works. Um, but, you know... She's a very popular character, so people are saying that she has to be broken, or else the Chinese community is going to be outraged about this character. Mm. And the other character that they're back releasing... On whether or not he, she manages to be overpowered or not. Yeah, which other character are we interested in here? And the other character they're releasing is Adventure Teen. Adventure Teen is kind of like the scumbag that you can't trust. He's saying that he's the good guy at the end of the story, but he always gives you, like... Like, really mixed signals that you can't really trust him. You, you, you know what good guys say, is, uh, say in the story, oh, we're the good guys. That's what the good guys say. That's literally this guy is doing to you all the time. <laughs> it's like, I, I'm telling you I'm the good guy. Uh, you just killed my friend there kind of thing. It's like, no, I'm the good guy. Trust me, bro. Mm. That's kind of like this guy in a nutshell. Okay. I, I heard that. I'm, I heard like people like from the beta, they like buffed this guy like four different times just so that they could get people interested in him because nobody seems to like him. Are you interested now? No, no way. He's a guy. I'm not rolling for guys. <laughs> so, you're, so you're part of the Adrenaline community then, who's like, oh my god. I do, have a, guy a, I do have a guys in my account, okay? I have Locha. <laughs> okay. He is. I only roll for guys if they're meta. Okay? I like how Chow, <laughs> within the same podcast, reports on <laughs> studios having to apologize for introducing male characters and being like, I don't roll with that character. <laughs> Uh, well, he'll, uh, he he's okay with them in the Azure Lane game if they're or the uh, upcoming Azure Lane developed game if they're meta. Okay. Look, I roll on Sandophon and Grand Blue because he's meta. But if he wasn't meta, I would skip. Dang, that's uh, fighting words. I don't care. He's the most popular. If he's not meta, I'm not rolling. See uh, another upcoming beta test. Lots of beta tests or, or signing up for beta tests in this podcast. Uh, Inazuma Eleven Victory Road, the big RPG from Level Five, part of their big slate of games that was supposed to release last year and are now releasing ostensibly this year. Um, it'll have a beta test on Nintendo Switch beginning on March twenty eighth. And as far as I understand, uh, Adam, this is an open beta that anyone can partake in. I think so. Yep. So. And it's are a you, global beta, and it's it seems like this is the sort of thing they actually they actually shared a post about it earlier. By earlier, I mean like last year about the plans for this beta. They basically were very upfront in saying we need a lot of players to test this game, more than just a few hundred. We need a lot, and we are going to take our time on this. So this beta is the it seems like it's going to be going on for a while, like months long beta, oh, and they actually okay. are going to update oh. it. They're actually going to update it over time with like story stuff. Um, <laughs> so, it's more like, so it's more like early access. Yeah, no, but Weird. the thing is, is none of it will transfer in the end, or at least like some, well, I mean, some like training data will, I guess. But I guess yeah, I guess some early access stuff works like that. But um, but yeah, it's basically a really huge test of I guess online capabilities and balance and all of that. I wish the beta was for more platforms. Yeah, PC. <laughs> the game is coming out on practically everything, I think. But this beta is only for Switch. Yeah, there's coming uh, on PlayStation platform, Switch, mobile, and Steam. Yeah. Uh, By the way, yeah, was it was it officially announced for Steam? I remember like it wasn't at yeah, first. It, and then it, it was announced like shortly it... afterward. Yeah, okay. it was. It's official yeah. now. So well, the beta test is only for the Switch, is it, or is it for? Yeah, 
No, yeah, the beta is only for Switch. It, yeah, the beta that they're, they're talking about is only for Switch. Yeah, that's so, so weird. That, yeah, if they want to like have extensive testing, I would assume you'd want to test every device. Yeah, you want to test every system. releasing on. Here, let me let me read. This is actually something they put out last November. This is actually during. If you remember, they had their like level five Vision two. Level 5 right. Vision 2 stream. <laughs> this is basically what they said about the beta test. And they, this is said in English. To put it bluntly, we absolutely do not want Inazuma 11 to fail. And it's not just about success or failure in a business sense. It's about reliably meeting user expectations and setting the stage for the beginning of the next chapter in the history of Inazuma 11. This time we want to put the most effort into the matches, specifically the competitive aspects. A game so deep that you can play for dozens of hours without even getting close to the bottom, while remaining enjoyable all the way. This requires extensive testing, and even having 100 testers for months most likely wouldn't suffice. Above all, the main goal is to finalize specifications by incorporating the opinions of everyone eagerly awaiting this game to come out. Therefore, we want as many people as possible to play this game while there's still room for adjustments. And so I you want to know how you get a lot of people for, uh, playing it? <laughs> you should probably release it on more than one platform for this beta. Yeah, I hope it doesn't end up like, uh, was it Unus 2? It's like how they didn't do a beta oh, for yeah. Steam, and then the game launched at like a broken state on PC because oh, it, it's fine on consoles because we have a beta test there, but we didn't do a beta test on PC, so it launched right. like in this broken state. I mean, I I I hope for the best for this game, and if I remember to fucking play the for download the beta and play it, I sure will. But it's just like this that's kind of a weird statement to put out, and then only release it on Switch for this beta. Best of luck. I, I I want this game to be really cool. It's been it's been a series that's like it's look cool from like an outsider. By the way, they also released a new trailer that is basically just a bunch of like anime super skill soccer football. Hell yeah! Abilities. It's, it's anime shell and soccer. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> look, yeah, I skimmed through. I'm like, these fucking abilities look fucking crazy. <laughs> um, yeah. That's on like March 28th, right? You said. Yep, that's just next week. Yep. Damn, dude. Time to talk about this game next week and be like, it's the best game ever. Going into April dates, we already talked about April 18th being the second DLC for Final Fantasy 16. Uh, we knew that this was going to come at some point in the first half of the year, but the CRPG Broken Roads, which was supposed to release last year, but had kind of a very last minute indefinite delay due to several issues has gotten has gotten a new trailer and a new release date slated for april 10th um th this is for uh, all versions except the switch version which has been announced but well, the switch version will be releasing at a unspecified later date so we've talked about this game a few times we actually had someone on staff page had access to the game you know intending for the initial release last last winter uh and then um Got delayed last minute. Because yeah, this, this is, it was this is literally the hot. case. This is literally the case where they sent out review codes for this game, and basically the overwhelming review response is like, "This game is really broken, like really bad. What are you doing?" Yeah, and you're like, not, "Oh yeah, we yeah, need yeah, to delay this." this. Not ready. <laughs> so, so yeah, they did. Yeah, well, everything I hear about this game, like in terms of like the style of game, it's kind of like a mix between like Disco Elysium and Fallout. Um, at least that's the way that you know. That's Plus how Australia, games are marketed. <laughs> yeah. Plus Australia. <laughs> Plus the Outback. <laughs> it's it seems like a really interesting game, and I'm in, and I'm eager to play it. It's just that I, I know, like in that initial review period, everyone that had access really didn't have a lot of good word of mouth for it. So hopefully they took the like hopefully you know the time that they you know put it back into the into the oven, so to speak, really helped it out. Um, and it'll be releasing in not too long. L plus Fallout plus Disco Elysium plus Australia. Yeah, there you go. There you go. No, hopefully this game like is in a much better state. Honestly, it does look really cool. But it it was it was a very it, it was I believe it was like six days before its initial release on the, in the last November that they delayed it. And then, oh shit! No, they were literally <laughs> just <nothing else. laughs> they probably knew it was in a pretty bad state. But then once they got reports from. Like reviewers, it's like, oh, this this is not shit. Yeah, you, you definitely want to put your best foot forward, you know. And some releases like this week they didn't put their best foot forward under the launch date of this game. So, um, hopefully, it is in a much, much, much better state. You would hope so after taking multiple months to delay this. 
almost half a year. We go into release dates in June and July. May is still relatively, I won't say empty, because like so the System Shock remake, which is really great, is coming to console. We talked about Thousand Year Door remaster. But I'm like, May should just stay how it is. Just mm-hmm. avoid May, because I have plenty to play throughout from, from coming out in late April. But going I, into June. Go ahead. I'm, I'm, I was just going to say really quickly, I should I, I should have like uh, put a news post for this, but that one dungeon crawler i played at um day of the devs in uh december crypt master is coming out in may i was so, wondering oh. if we should cover this because it's sort of like a vocabulary dungeon crawler it's kind of like it was kind of like a puzzle game dungeon crawler with language it's kind of weird it's it's an it's enough of an rpg from what i've played but it, okay. yeah i just figured i'd mention it here probably should have done a uh news post for it but yeah that and paper mario are basically the only two major releases in uh may so far and then going into june we have the release date for sukahime a piece of blue uh, a piece of blue glass moon coming out on june 27th in the west playstation and switch (laughs) i so okay yeah I, I still can't believe it's real, and I'm super looking forward to like seeing what 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 the English script uh, official English script looks like. I'm very very excited. Yep. Um, or are people gonna skip out on this to play Trails into Daybreak? I mean, they're so too different. Waiting for that. It, it's it's it, it's pretty. I I don't think the the audiences overlap. To be honest. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure there's some overlap, but I mean, Not too much. I I guess. I guess it's there's at least some overlap because isn't like the one book series and like Cold Steel one basically just Tsukihime? Yes, it was. <laughs> was it the Red Red Moon something? Yeah, because I remember like when I was playing through Cold Steel like for the first time. That was after I'd read the original Tsukihime, so I was reading it's so like oh. Falcom, Falcom. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. But uh, yeah, I'm I'm definitely day one looking up PlayStation. Hopefully they've. So the the weird thing is like, hmm. I need I to this, pre-order I, I the Switch to, version of this because I want this game the, to be on PC. And yeah, that they, that that's the reason why I'm pre-ordering the Switch version. <laughs> you can always oh, spend oh, money man. on the Gotcha game because it's it's really weird. Like they <laughs> they sort of soft announced this game at their official Type Moon Ace issue, like the latest issue of it. Because, but it was like in the very it is the softest way possible possible where they had a uh, section of Suki Hime on it on their official magazine that had PC as one of the platforms on it. But they never like outright stated it, and they it never apologized. And they never, yeah. they never apologized that they misprinted it either. That's the thing. Yeah, like you would and, you would think that if that was an error, they would apologize for it and say, oh, that's not the case. But they never did either. And this issue yeah. has been out for many months now. So yeah, it's I'm like... sure I'm sure that it will come to PC eventually, even if it was an error. Just because, like, obviously... Um, Witch on the Holy uh, Night did. Yeah, Witch on the Holy Night just came out, like, a yeah. couple of months ago. It did really well. And obviously, Fate Stay Night's... Uh, I still can't believe you can say Fate Stay, uh, Stay Night's localization will be on PC day one. <laughs> so fucking crazy. That's coming out this year. Oh. We don't... I'm I trying can... to remember an incident that's kind of similar. Do you remember like with Square Enix with Dragon Quest, uh, Dragon Quest 11, where they like <laughs> announced like a Switch version, <laughs> and they had to tell everyone like, "No, we're not making a Switch." Well, version wait, 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 wait a second. Wait a second. You're you're misremembering, Chow. They announced a version for the Nintendo NX, the very first game confirmed yeah. for the platform. Yeah. Oh man, yeah. So, yeah. and that, that, that was a fascinating thing too, because like, like it also had like a separate version on like the 3DS. That was like you know the 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 2D 2D version, pixel version. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, Tsukihime and Face Day Night both. Pretty fucking long visual novels. So it's just like on top of already all the fucking long RPGs that we have releasing, there's also two gar- like gigantic miracle it visual novel it, localizations. It's it's wild how like this year is definitely shaping up to be a a slower year for folks that play that don't play uh for lack of a better word Eastern developed games. But if you do, 
it's like, holy shit, where's the time and money to play all of these? Oh, it's the holy grail of years of like, uh, of certain like players. It's Look, like, I still haven't finished Seven Rebirth yet. I am enjoying every minute of it. How dare you? That, that game has almost been out a month. How dare Look, you? I'm putting five hours just like a day. You know, it'll take a while. Okay? <laughs> you probably you get five hours, hours a day. <laughs> and then he's like, all right, I, I reach five hours clocking out. I get to finally have a day. <laughs> I mean, it's not even a joke, though. Like, if you've been playing like five hours a day and maybe you take a couple of days of break, like, that game, if you're doing everything, is like over 100 hours. So it makes sense that, like, I'm guessing Chow is like near, right near the end now, but. How far are you at a rebirth, Chow? Uh, I'm at Cosmo Canyon. You're oh, to God. Salute. <laughs> <laughs> never mind. You're never, never, never close to, you to the end. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, oh, you're you're only seventy hours in. I'm sorry, you've got ways to go. Oh, that's funny. But well, uh, that's yeah. actually kind of topical because speaking of Final Fantasy mm -hmm. um, and speaking mm -hmm. of not having enough time for Chow, uh, July second is the official release date. This is hot off the press. It was announced just literally like a handful of hours ago, I believe, you, at the time of can, recording. You can say the early access uh, date is the real date. Anyone that's that's actually going to be playing Dawn Trail is going to be playing it then. Yeah, okay, not to bury the lead. Uh, Final Fantasy XIV Dawn Trail, official release date, July 2nd. Um, yeah, the early access is June 28th. Yeah. Early access is anyone who pre-orders it. Is that how it works? Yeah, anyone that pre-orders it. And so the way it works is, is that uh, if you wanted to play Dawn Trail, but you didn't own any of the other expansions, what they do is if you buy the latest expansion, you get access to everything before that, but you don't get access until the full release date. So the early access period is only for people that are basically already current. Which is a little bit scummy, but whatever. Whatever. An interesting thing about like the when they're doing their PAX panel about this uh, game is like there's like some tie-in in-game bonus items for like F FF9. Remake confirmed, guys. <laughs> <laughs> it's just very weird. Like out of nowhere. Yeah, that that's that doesn't necessarily mean anything because yeah. we've had like FF5 stuff, we've had right. FF3 stuff, and obviously last expansion we had FF4 stuff. I mean, it could mean that we're finally getting that rumored remake. Finally, well, hopefully, but we don't know for sure. If you pre-order, you get a wind-up Zidane minion. <laughs> it just, I don't know what that means. <laughs> yeah. And then uh, you get one for Garnet with the collector's edition. So one fun thing is uh, apparently just like uh, recently, like when they announced this uh, release date, uh, Yoshi P said, so we actually wanted to release this earlier, but there's a certain DLC that's releasing this month, and we wanted to make sure that uh, people had time to play it. And then he just, just straight up said, "I want to play the Elden Ring DLC." <laughs> <laughs> hey, at least he's honest, you know. Uh, I respect that. So there, you, there you go. That's uh, that's, that's two that, games. That, that, yeah, that's Elden Ring DLC victim number two. <laughs> <laughs> that's not even the final one. Brian. Yeah, I was I was thinking how to introduce this, but whatever, I'll <laughs> take it. So yeah, another release date. Uh this is coming out in August. This is a Souls like Italian RPG, Anatria, the last song. So this was originally slated to release on the exact same day as the Elden Ring DLC. And then they immediately said, We're going to change release date. We talked about this, I think, two weeks ago. They they announced on their Twitter that they had an announcement in their Discord. So I joined their Discord, and then in the Discord they say, "Okay, at this future game show, was a future game show? Um, yeah, we're going to announce the new release date." And then that just happened. And like, all right, now now we're going to actually tell you the new release date. Anatria, the last song, will release on August twenty first. So right um, next to Black Myth Wukong. Yeah. If that yeah, if that game is real, I, I don't trust that date on <laughs> on Black Myth. But and then so so Anatria, the last song, Elden Ring. Uh, casualty number three i think we're up to um moved its release date back to mid-august and then additionally they said that uh for august they're not going to release on xbox um at least not right away uh which is which i'm just gonna be honest this is actually kind of fucked up because like if i remember correctly the very first like showcase for this game was through like an id at xbox stream showcase so it's like normally i'm like whatever but it's like 
seriously? It's also Seriously? kind of weird. In, it's also kind of weird in that when they announced the previous release date, they said it was for Xbox. Then they delayed yeah. it. Then they announced a new release date, and it's no longer for Xbox. It's like that's kind of weird. Oh, so, I don't know if you got this email. Oh, um, I did the letter. Okay, okay, yeah, the letter. Today. Yeah, because it was addressed to me. I was like, did anyone else get this letter? So it was a letter from the CEO Jama Games, Giacomo Greco. I won't read the full letter because it's actually pretty lengthy. But it's like it's basically a letter to the Xbox community apologizing to all Xbox players, and I'll, I'll, I'll just I'll, I'll just read the latter part of it. it says uh, from uh, once again this from the CEO of Drama Games saying I prefer the game to be perfect on two platforms rather than discrete on three. When released when we release the game, we'll also be working on the Xbox version as well as the DLC, so we can also give the game to Microsoft users. So this will be eventually coming to Xbox at a later date. The choice fell on PS5 rather than on Xbox simply because we have a, a relationship. With our partners in Asia, Sega, with, wh- with whom we have agreements with that we want to respect with them as a matter of respect. So, as you all, all know, the Asian market is a, for a large part dominated by the PlayStation, so the PS5 was a logical choice. So, and uh, that's just uh, a snippet of like part of the yeah. apology to Xbox players. So, they're just saying that like we'll release on Xbox later. It's not been, it hasn't been canceled. It's just it'll come at a later date. Right now, we're prioritizing. Uh, PS5 and PC, just to get them as, as get the game as uh, to as good of a state as possible, uh, and focusing on those two. Yeah, I do think it is pretty messed up though for like Xbox fans that were waiting for this for so long. It's like basically at the last moment they're like, yeah, you're not getting it at launch. Yeah, it's like I, I do think that like they they could have handled this a lot better. If you were going to have to delay the game even further, just delay the game even further. It's I don't know. It doesn't, it doesn't feel great, you know. But you know, it, it, the, the 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 small solace is it, it'll eventually come to Xbox. It hasn't been outright canceled, but we'll see how long it'll take to get there. It, it, do, it does seem like it does seem like a cool game too. Like from what I played of it back at PAX West last year, interesting. Um. Souls like that they have on their hands for the whole mask changing mechanic. And that covers us for uh, upcoming release dates, beta dates, registration dates, all those sorts of things. Um, sadly, we do have one more headline here this week, kind of echoes of two weeks ago with uh, the obituary for Akira Toriyama. We have another influential figure passing away um, this month. That is, Tales of Series character designer Mutsumi Inamata has passed away earlier this month on March 10th. Uh, She's been with the Tales of Series since Tales of Destiny and has been providing art for like two decades. And uh, passed away at the age of 63, so still relatively young. So, of course, very sad. That we want to know, and she also did work on early Dragon Quest, um, Mobile Suit Gundam Seed, and a few other properties as well. Um, yeah, Inamata has such a distinct art style and like color style that is very endearing. Um, did a ton of immediately recognizable. Yeah, immediately recognizable. Did a ton of character designs for the Tales series. Um, also did a lot of Dragon Quest work, specifically with like the novels. So you can find like dragon quest art for like at least like the first five or six games from Inomata for all of those characters um i really liked the art style you know i think it was very appealing and uh very unique i like the colors a lot and so kind of hoped i would get to see her art again on a future project but unfortunately that won't be the case yeah that's that's, uh, for tales fans like you know like uh, she was one of the like the primary character designers, like along with Kosuke Fujishima, mm-hmm. uh, Fu- uh, and uh, Inomata worked on like very, very popular, well known tales of entries like Destiny, um, Exilia. Um, uh, obviously, Zestaria is not a popular one, but also worked on Zestaria. Races. Because, you know, <laughs> yeah, Graces. Basically, um, everything almost. It's just a few ones that they didn't do. Because I, I think uh, Kosuke Fujishima is not as available as. Yeah Kosuke, yeah, Kosuke did like um, Fa- Fantasia, um, Abyss. Also did Abyss, yeah, Symphonia, um, and mm-hmm. then 
It's yeah, like, okay. and, and, and they collaborate. It's not like one or the other. Like they usually collaborate together. Like for like uh, Fujishima will do some characters yeah. at an entry, and then Inomata will do other characters in the in the same entry. Like even like the main characters in Zestiria was like kind of split down on. Who, who the the fan base is wild back in those days. They were like complaining back then. It'll be like, oh, it's like the game's not good if she was in charge for some reason. It's like that's why they wait, had to like fight hard to get Casecape back. And then it's like, oh, it's made, then it's like it really made no difference, you know. It's just but but, but even even beyond just like you know the the, the very important works in the Tales of series. You know, we mentioned it uh, like a, a little bit of the anime, but just even beyond character design, like Inomata was a very talented animation. Person, did, did a lot of key animation animation for very popular but yeah, older on the older side um anime like space warrior baldios did animation on that animation director for the city hunter series very very like it's on the older side but a very iconic formulative uh series in anime um even you chow you just recently watched Cyber yeah, Formula. Yeah, Cyber Formula. She did all the character designs for that. And the thing is, like, if you watch anything from the 80s to the 90s, guaranteed there's a high chance that she probably did the character design or the key animation for those things back in those mm-hmm. days. Yeah. So we so, we lost a great talent right here. It's yeah. very sad. You know, Mata brought, you know, so much great greatness to the, the world of art. You know, so it's just. Once again, a really, really, really sad passing. You know, and it's the passage of time, unfortunately. It sucks. <laughs> but it's how it is. So the no, rest so, in peace. Rest in peace, Mitsumi Inomata. All the news and reviews and guides and everything that we talked about can be found on RPGsite.net. You can find us at RPG Site on all the social media platforms, YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. You can join our Discord at discord.gg slash RPG site. Um, and as always, we'll be back next week with another episode of the TetraCast. Until you hear from us then, stay safe and take care. And we'll talk to you all later. Later, folks. <laughs>